Hello, everybody. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special episode of the Transatlantic Rebels podcast. My name is Jessel, and this week we've got a very, very special guest called Raj Kotecha. Me and him go way back, and this is a recording of, uh, well, what is pretty much a, a private dinner between the two of us. There's so much to cover, and there are many, many points, but the main point you'll take away from it is how much better a person he is at life than I am. So, it's super long, however, there will be a condensed version coming up if you can't stomach this whole thing, but the main thing to do is just leave it on, dip in, out, and uh, there are so many gems that he drops. So I really hope that you enjoy it, and uh, let us know the feedback. So, maybe you can give some context. Basically, the floor is yours for the next up to one minute, because I'm going to go in the kitchen and get food. And this will be a nice surprise for me when I listen in playback, as to see how you actually set this up, because however you contextualize this show is what this show is going to be. So I'm going to be right back and put my headphones on the ground. The world is yours. Okay, let's just make sure he's gone. Okay, guys, I'm organizing a surprise birthday party. for No, no. Okay, so basically, uh, Raj and I are definitely of a similar ilk in many, many respects. And it's more for, I guess, kind of privileged, unconventional middle-class people. Like, if you're struggling to find water every day and stuff, I guess this is not really the podcast for you. If you're just kind of someone who went to school and is working or this or that, uh, then this is probably going to resonate with you a bit, maybe. It's also, I'm going to try not to be all old man advice to youngsters about it because I'm not an old man and my advice is terrible. So if anything, you should do the opposite. But basically, I think there are going to be a few kind of gems dropped here and there through Raj and myself because we are people who have... um, lived interesting lives compared to the kind of standard brown print. (laughs) So, yeah, let's just see how it goes, effectively. Um, The the main kind of thesis of this podcast is really about how I've decided to live my life in reverse. So it's not like a Benjamin Button thing. It's just about basically taking those standard Asian cliches about you have to do this, this, that, and then that. And then flipping it around and thinking, okay, actually, do I need to do this? That might be right for certain other people, but is it right for me? So that's the kind of thesis behind the podcast. Um, We're also going to be eating at the same time and drinking wine. So uh, those two things could derail my well thought out uh, premise. But let's see. Wherever it goes, it goes. Uh, We're both recording this. So uh, just in case any kind of uh, blackmail material comes up, we've both got a copy. That's the basic thing. So Raj and I have known each other for now about, I don't know, five, six years, something like that. And then we discovered... um, Here is a shit ton of food. Oh, perfect. Look at that. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to have to, like, be careful in terms of, like, how much noise we create. So I'm going to... Oh, and tissues for you. Oh, thank you. There you go. Does the listener have all the context they need? Yes, they do. Good. (laughs) I mean, that's going to be such a nice moment for me to put my headphones on and hear you, like, maybe cussing me out for the first one minute. or maybe Spoiler not. alert, we lost them already. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, so on our plates right now, we have chicken pad ki mao, which is known as drunken chicken to people, which is a combination of soy sauce and chili. And it's got some big fat tomatoes in it, some juicy broccoli, some awesome green beans, of course, chicken. And then right on top, I have put two... Chicken satays. How's, how is it on the ground? For context, I live in Dubai. Jessel lives here in London. We're both, we're each other's spirit animals. Yes. That's what I tried to explain to my girlfriend. I was like, I was, it was, she was like, how can he be your spirit animal if he's a human? This was on one of my doting conversations to her earlier on today about, yeah, I'm doing a podcast with Jessel. I fucking love him. And um, she hates me, by the way. Yeah. Should we tell her why? Yeah. Should we talk right. about your podcast first. So basically, I'm the co host, stroke founder of a podcast called The Transatlantic Rebels. And we tend to talk about music, films, T 
TV and books, but we did a special bonus podcast, which was about relationships. So my co-host, his name is Rashad, he, um, he's still single and, uh, you know, in the dating game and all that kind of stuff. So he wanted to do a podcast picking my brains because I'm married. So um, I was also quite drunk. Um, so it was great. He asked me loads of questions. I was very honest and we recorded the whole thing. And, and it was kind of like you were hacking into our private conversation. Um, but it was really interesting. So uh, anyway, Raj told me that he was listening to it one time and um, and his girlfriend. Mm-hmm. We can say that now. It's official. Our okay. girlfriend. Okay. And uh, his girlfriend kind of caught bits of it and stuff. And Raj resonated in particular with one uh, aspect of the podcast, which is where I was saying how I, I like to kind of... We swear or not? Mm-hmm. Okay. How I like we, can to, always take this, we can always take this shit out if we need to. Okay. How I like to kind of fuck with my wife, basically, and just sort of play games and, and mess around and have fun kind of thing. So, um, I mean, you, you can listen to the podcast. It's just called Bonus Relationships. I can't remember what number it is. Maybe 29, something like that. I don't know. And uh, anyway, Raj particularly liked this. This is the one thing he probably took away from the podcast and decided to try and explain it to his girlfriend and um, using the words Jessel was right every time he wanted to sort of mess around with his own girlfriend and play jokes on her and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, as a result, she hates me, which I don't think is fair and accurate representation, um, unless she already hated me. Which okay, fine, No, I don't think enough. she hates you. I think that... I think that... Um, let me think. I think she might hate that there's another me out there. <laughs> I think that could be it. I think that there's somebody whose psychology is the right combination of lunacy and logic. And that's what your point was. So your point was, for those who who have not jumped out to check this this point out, is that being in a relationship is great because you've got, you've constantly got someone to fuck with. And me and Jessel are the type of dudes that we actually photosynthesize when other people get annoyed, right? So the fact that you can hear him chewing and swallowing on the mic right now, and that might piss you off, is actually helping us regrow our hair. Like it's... <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it's the In the wrong ever. places, unfortunately. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so it comes with age. But like, so I just thought that was brilliant. And then obviously like, there'd be a point where you get the reaction you want from your significant other. And you just like revel in the fact that, I mean, I've annoyed every girlfriend I've ever had. I take great pride in it. But when you actually realize what the logic is behind it, which was the logic you shared on the podcast, it makes it even sweeter. Cause you're like, man, that's what Jessel was talking about. And <laughs> Jessel was right. And she said that if you say Jessel was right one more time in this house, I'm going to go to his house and harm him. Or I'm going to find him and harm him. And I just thought that's hilarious because she doesn't have a harmful bone in her body. But the fact that I think that's when it clicked, that that would be the kind of thing that I would say. For example, today you were coming home just to, eat and hang out and talk shit like we do maybe once every one or two years. And I regard my best, best friends in the world as people that if I'm lucky, I see them once a year. Um, And then last night, midnight plus change, I texted you and said, yo, bring an SM58 in an Excel. I'll bring a microphone basically for non-nerds and uh, let's just record our chat. And you were thinking... That was my plan all along. Really? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, My my one worry was that it would be a video podcast and I'm not conventionally good looking. So uh, Raj is much better looking than me on the camera. So I was kind of like, sugar. Uh, I hope this isn't a video podcast. So yeah, that kind of worked out perfectly. There's no live streaming or anything like that. No. There's no live streaming, but I was going to call Arjun, who you met at the the, It's The Real podcast, and say, look, come and video this. But then there's a certain... I think you rob when it comes to podcasts with video podcasts. I think you rob the imagination mm. of, a, of a couple of things when you when you include the video element. And I know that Lewis Howes and Gary Vaynerchuk and you know a lot of people are now putting the video versions. You know Joe Rogan, of course. But I don't. I don't know. I just feel like I feel like it's just a short dress. It's just giving away too much. You know. Um, okay, so it's the real podcast. You came to it. We were just about to talk about it, but then. Yeah, it was really interesting. So for context, I sponsored a event. I flew over. It's the real Eric and Jeff Rosenthal, two Jewish podcasters. There are about 135 podcasts in uh, with hip hop artists, where the podcast format is very similar to what we're doing right now, which is sitting here uh, on my dining table with two mics talking. Um, they would have a third person like that they would interview, and I thought it would be cool and progressive and for the culture, which is a new term to bring them over to the UK and 
have them interview DJ Semtex, who hasn't done much in the way of media and telling his story. So I thought that'd be a good crack. And you came along as a guest and what, we've not really got into it face to face and I'm glad we've not. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. It was very interesting. I, to be perfectly honest, I didn't know who these guys were. Yeah. No idea whatsoever. Never That's seen fair. or heard of them ever before. Really? Ever. And you, you listen to podcasts, right? Or no? I listen to podcasts. <clears throat> I'm, um, you know, into hip hop massively. Uh, I didn't know who they were. Mm. Because they, like we were talking about before, video podcasts or, or YouTube kind of things and stuff like that, um, I, I just, I never watch anything except maybe the odd tech review on a mobile phone and that's basically it. Mm-hmm. Um, so if it's not audio podcasts or something that really attracts my attention, then uh, then I, I, it just wouldn't, I, I would never even look at it or anything like that. Right. The, the, I mean, the only exception is something like the Dave Chappelle show, which I watched, but then even his successes, Key and Peele, had no idea who they were until I watched the film Get Out. Oh, were they in that? Um, the, one of the guys directed it, uh, Peele. Oh. Jordan Peele? I really enjoyed that film, bro. What, Get Out? Yeah. Oh my God. It's my because, favorite film of this year. It's literally my favorite film of this year. Because I thought, you know, growing up in the 80s in the UK, I thought there was a lot of similarities between the black and brown experience yeah. until I saw that shit. And I was like, no, being black's way worse. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> I could have just, we could have just had a bit of a tax conversation at that dinner party and everything would have been okay. But boy, that was some serious shit. And it really, it was amazing because like The Matrix, it kind of got you in that what if scenario. What if this is an actual real thing and this is happening somewhere in the world right now that I'm not aware of or I live in parallel to this. And that shit was just dope. Like, did that come out this year though? I feel like I watched it, it last year on the plane. No, it came out this year, like January or February or something. Like that. Really? In fact, I did a podcast of it with um, this amazing film critic called Leslie Byron Pitt. Mm-hmm. You can catch him on Twitter at Afro Film Viewer. Yeah. And he's got a website called Afro Film Viewer blog or net or something yeah and um he's a black guy mm. and so and he's got a white girlfriend yeah and they literally wow. just got engaged so um so we we did a like an hour and 40 minutes on this film there was just so much to talk about it's one of the best podcasts we've done and one of the most well received as well we both loved the film it was just wow. incredible so he really identified with it a lot and he was like you know you don't understand as a black guy some of the things that people say to you they're just unbelievable. There's no filter. And he's even talking about people from his fiance's family, like, uh, you know, the kind of the shit they come out with. Yeah. They just, they don't even think, Oh, this person might be offended by it or anything like that. That's, that's crazy. And then get out adds so many different layers. The first time yeah. you watch it, you're just experiencing that visceral thrill of everything. The second time you watch it, you notice all these things. Cause you know what that kind of key spoiler is, which Cut we're not going to say. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then it, it, there are so many beautifully little interwoven things into it. Yeah. Um, so if anyone hasn't watched Get Out, um, go watch it, listen to my podcast, and um, and then it, we will kind of go into all these different layers. It's, it's really interesting, actually. Transatlantic Rebels available on iTunes and Android now. Correct. Um, I've got through my food a lot faster. That's because you've been talking as well. Yeah. Do you want a spoon? No, 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 it's fine. Are you sure? I don't want to spoon with you. No, but yeah, do you want to spoon as a way to consume more food? Your girlfriend would hate me even more then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or not. Who knows? Who knows? We don't know each other that well. That might be a thing. Now, what What else? What else would we have normally talked about if we weren't wired up to microphones? And... Okay, hang on. You can throw me something because I'm about I'm, to I'm going to throw you something. Right, okay. And you can throw me the wine though first though. Oh, okay. Because this shit is fire. It is amazing. You know what? I don't normally spend like north of £10 on wine. And I saw the yellow sticker, which as a Gujarati is like the best thing you can ever see. Yeah. And this is a hot medoc. Hot means like hot culture, which is what new. Hi. Hi. This is a high medoc. And I actually don't know what the fuck else it is. I just know it's tasty as shit. Hot medoc, 2012, available for £17 in your local Morrisons. Can I just say, and let me say this with... I don't even know how I feel behind this. I just feel like I say it a lot when I come to the UK. When you have bought food in Dubai, where there's not much natural organic, you know, items, when you walk through Morrison's or Sainsbury's or Tesco or Waitrose or a shop that's gold plated, it is literally, literally like they're giving food away for free in the UK. 
the economies of scale for these large retailers to buy items for 63 million people versus however many people live in Dubai is phenomenal. Like I did a, I did a, dude, I literally was so excited the other day. I didn't know the word for this. My little sister told me, my 16 year old uh, sister, shout out to Ria. She was like, this was a haul. So what happens is people go to the store and then they buy some shit and then they open it on camera to be like, this is what I bought. She goes, I saw your Morrison's haul. I was like, yeah, it is a haul. But I actually got so excited about the 12 or 15 items that I bought from Morrison's and the fact that it averaged out at like 30 pounds, including like Cathedral City cheese, which you literally, in outside the UK, Cathedral City costs stem cells and Bitcoins. That's how you pay for Cathedral City cheese. <laughs> Like, literally, they're like, if you, like, in Dubai, I'm like, I want to buy Cathedral City. And they're like, oh, how much bone marrow do you have right now that you can donate to us to pay for it? So here you can just fill up your bag and just come home with the most amazing food, the most amazing wine. And I have no point. I literally have nothing to draw you in on this with. I just want to let you know that it's absolutely one of my sources of happiness when I'm in the UK. It's brilliant. I absolutely agree. And <clears throat> like, if you contrast it to someone like New York... You're walking around Manhattan thinking, you know what, I just want to buy some bread, some butter and some cheese and mm. some ham or something. Mm. Can't fucking do it. No one will sell you it. There are no corner shops or anything like that. There are no Tesco Express type things. There's nothing. Go to the bodega. Even that. I but mean, they're not selling you. They're not selling you yeah. like fresh produce in terms of like you've got refrigerated things and all these kinds of things. True. It's, it's a massive stitch up in Manhattan, especially where they want you to eat out all the time. Mm-hmm. That's why food is dead cheap and it, it, it's like double the helpings as well. You can, yeah. you can buy one meal and live off it for three weeks or something. <laughs> you know, taxis out there are like, you know, ridiculously cheap as well. Yeah. Um, but they don't want you to cook. Whereas at least in this country, the thing I like is you get all these cooking programs constantly and then eat your ready meal whilst you're watching it. But at least you have the option to buy ingredients mm. and, and it's not too expensive. I mean, don't get me wrong. The, the cost of food relative to people's wages and stuff is still increasing and, and it is a pressure thing. Mm. But you can be clever about things, you know. Mm. You can get, like you said, a haul. I, I was a bit confused and then you meant H-A-U-L. Yeah. You? yeah. What do you think I meant? H-O-L-E. I thought you meant like a food hall, like like Selfridge's food hall. Or got something you, like. got you. Which, yeah. by the way, mm. they opened an M&S food hall in Dubai and every expat, every British person certainly that lives there, lost their shit. Like it was like that, the levels of, it was literally like one more chance to see Prince. Yeah. It was like that. I've literally been there as well. What? To the M&S food hall. In Dubai? Yeah. No, it just opened like four months ago. No, I haven't been there. Then. Ah, what were you thinking of? No, there was, but there's an M&S. I was thinking of the Burj Khalifa. No, <laughs> <laughs> no but there's like an M&S in that, in the big mall, right? No. No, there's been an MS there for years. For like seven or eight years at least. Well, so MS food. No, just the, okay. the spin off. Okay, okay. Yeah. That was the thing that people must have shit. Oh, about. wow. I'm not surprised. I love MS. It is good, but it got. You remember, do you remember in the 2000s when it got caning? Mm. When literally it had its skirt pulled up and its share price was just completely fucking out there and deaded. It, the share price is always fluctuating because they don't make good clothes anymore. They make clothes for 70 year olds who have now. Like moved on for it basically. Yeah, and we're halfway there. Yeah, yeah. But places, yeah. places to make money. The conversation of the day has to be Bitcoin. In, out, shaking it about. I, I missed my opportunity with Bitcoin massively. They got, say you don't. They say you can't. Even at six thousand plus change. Yeah. They say that there's no time to miss out. There's a, there's a friend to the podcast um, called Prems. He's a rapper, actually. Yeah. And uh, for some reason, I always thought he was Punjabi. And then literally a few days ago, he's... I saw that on your social. Yeah. He's actually uh, he's actually same as us. He's Gujarati Luana. Oh, and, I felt um, you know, I used to go down into it. Exactly. And um, anyway, he, he's really into Bitcoin. So mm-hmm. he set up a, a, his own Bitcoin website and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was literally going to pull the plug on buying some Bitcoin when it was about... I think it was about 1,500... And when? It, that was a long time ago. Six months ago. Right. Since then, it's gone up to 6,000. And I was like, sugar. Like, it's gone up to 6,000, so it's gone up four times. Yeah, it's mm. gone up four times since then. Mm. And I, I, I was just like, I kept thinking, shall I jump in, shall I jump in? But then some of my other stocks are going so well, so I was like, oh, don't worry, but they haven't gone that well. Mm. So um, it happens, you know. But it, I think it's an interesting premise. He, he taught me a lot about it as well. And... Um, I think it's here to stay, to be honest. People keep saying, oh, it's just a bubble, it's just going to crash, it's a scam, this kind of stuff. No, it's not a scam. If you actually 
read into it. There are real levels to it. Yeah, cryptocurrency and stuff. It's 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 going to be huge. Like, it's not going to be something that's going to replace cash anytime soon or anything like that. But for certain markets, it's going to be really big. Well, isn't the movement of money digitally on your credit card still technically a? It's a cryptocurrency. I mean, it's it's encrypted and it moves around from device to device. It's not on the blockchain. I get all the other nuances. Yeah. But like, I think it's I think it's still it's a digital representation of physical money. That's true. Whereas Bitcoin is literally just completely digital. Yeah, yeah. You I'm interested, though. I want to get involved. Yeah. I am getting involved as of this week. But it's not just Bitcoin. There's also something called Ethereum, and then there's various other ones. Ethereum's had a really good run recently. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not on top of it like I am with the stock market, but mm-hmm. um, it, there's a guy called Prems. You can look him up. I think it's Prems Online is his social media stuff, and um, he, he's on it. He's got his own website and stuff. So. Stocks-wise, what are you feeling? Oh, there's a lot right now, to be honest. Yeah. Speaking of which, PayPal. Yeah, if I think I was, I was kind of thinking about it earlier, looking into it. And if you're looking at something over the next ten years, you just wanted to park your money in. Mm. You couldn't do too much better than PayPal, I think, right. because there is a war on physical cash. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Mastercard, Visa—they're both being good performers. PayPal is doing really well right now, and they also own Venmo. And like, yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I've never used Venmo before. Yeah, 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 I've never used Uber before, but you know. You never used Uber before? Not once. What the fuck? No, no, just, there's just no product need for you for that for that particular. None at all. Right. right. So, um, yeah, but but PayPal, I think, is a really good shout. There are right. lots of others. I don't know. It's still it's still a bull market, and it's been going on for eight years now. So people keep waiting for it to sort of collapse into a bear market or a recession or this or that. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. You might get a correction, but. That's just another buying buying opportunity. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tony Robbins has been like very vocal, saying that there's been annual corrections, and the numbers he's bringing up are good. But the the, old, the, the concept of a correction on steroids, where we have a full on recession, mm. um, there's no markers, but there are lots of people. I just did a podcast in Dubai with uh, David Daly on VAT. Guy's like a super OG when it comes to like finance and shit, and he um he was at the end of the interview, he was like, "Look, this recession is coming," and he goes, "It's going to make." Oh wait, recession looked like a complete walk in the park. And my addition to that is that if we do have another recession, let's say a re- recession occupies the market for two to five years, mm, two to four years, okay? When we come out the other side, with changes in consumer technology, with changes in manufacturing operations, i.e. going to Nando's and not ordering your food from a human being, so, you know, which is already the case. I was in... Um, I was in uh, McDonald's in Lisbon, I think, f- about a year ago. And that was up until the last minute, you did not see a human being until you got to the counter. And then now even in Leicester, like I went there and they rolled out the same in-store experience. So you basically go up to this massive, I would say probably north of 40, 40, 45 inch di- uh, screen. You tap in with your fingers what you want. Of course, you're sharing fingerprints with every other peasant that's been in there that day. And um, and then you order your food. And at the, at the very, very end, when you get to the counter, everything paid for, et cetera, et cetera, a human being hands you your food. And how long before it's not a human being that's handing you your food, you know? Or, or how long, even if every every behind every McDonald's counter, the staffing wage, you know, on the PL went down by 70%. Well, that would be interesting. You know, to McDonald's. So my my point to go round back to my original point is that if we do go into a recession right now, what's the world going to be when we come out the other side? Because what I liked about the last recession, you know, it worked in my favor from a business point of view. I used to sell packages, advertising and promotion packages to companies like Motorola for twenty five thousand dollars. Talk of the recession was coming in 08. The recession came and everybody wanted to spend five thousand, two thousand, you know, much much less money, and that's why I built creative content agency because you can get a podcast or a video for a couple of grand and that can help you meet your marketing objectives. But what happens on the other side of this recession? Because we came out, you know, even people that got fired from, even got people that got let go from all the big banks and the Lehman Brothers, a lot, quite a few of them ended up in the tech community. Quite a few of them ended up either as venture capitalists or entrepreneurs. So there was an orphanage to receive those people. But who's going to receive the guy who's just been let go of at Nando's or KFC or McDonald's or Clark's Shoes or... You understand what I mean? I think it's an interesting juncture in humanity because... Correct. I agree with that. The robots are coming. Yeah. And they're coming for our jobs. 
yeah. and and they're coming from ninety percent of our jobs. You know, like yeah. even even people are saying, "Oh, lawyers, are, lawyers are fucked." Lawyers are fucked. fucked. So everyone was like, "Oh, lawyers will be fine." No, but actually, only the top lawyers will be fine. Even bankers, the top bankers will be fine because they'll be the decision makers. Mm. But the actual the lower level ones doing all the grunt work right now. You know, a lawyer in the first three years, they're basically a, a human photocopying checker, basically. And that's all they do. They just check things over and over again, look at the photocopier, read through things. Once you can train a machine to do that, which already some companies are doing, yeah. it's going to kill their jobs. You know? So scenario A is that you give it to a paralegal, right? That's somebody below a legal person. They check all the cases. They go back to 1988 and they see like, you know, Rodriguez versus the city of Long Island or whatever. But now they're saying that you can basically put your case notes into an artificial intelligence device that will read every case note, <coughs> excuse me, every relevant case note, actually physically read the words on your document, whether it be a contract that you're disputing or whatever. It can interpret, you know, language and come back to you and be like, you know what? Actually, you were in the wrong on this contract. Your first option is going to be to take a, a bailout option of $2,500. Just take it. You know, don't fight this one because intelligence shows that you're going to be at a loss. Which, yes, you're right. Anybody who's in their first three to five years is potentially... And, the, the, and that's they're not talking gonna, about they're not lawyers and bankers. Yeah. If you're talking about your, your Nando's server or your McDonald's server, yeah. which is, you know, London is a service economy in... in more ways than one true you know it's services in terms of high level financial services and it's services in terms of you know low paying jobs true which people are already under pressure when you've got zero hour contracts and stuff like that and mm. the minimum wage has been raised so employees don't want to pay it anymore yeah and once the robots take the jobs that but this is my point it's an interesting juncture for, human, uh, for humanity because what are we going to choose as people do we have any choice in this do we have any volition in this or is this at the discretion of paymasters who will use robots to enrich themselves and we would be paying the money to them because we would be the idiots going to the restaurants, right? And saying, oh yeah, here's my money. Here's my five pounds for the McDonald's meal mm. that you just cut out 70% of your workforce. Mm. Um, and we would just be enriching the 1% even more mm. and widening the gap and losing our jobs. So it's kind of like, what are we going to choose? What what are the 99% or at least 95% going to choose? So if you look at economics, right, I think that what they would, let's just take Nando's, for example, right? The first thing that they would do is probably not increase the price of Nando's and the price of inflation. So in five years time, you'll still pay twelve ninety nine for a whole chicken when realistically you should be paying fourteen ninety nine. So now Nando's becomes even more of a competitive proposition in the F&B world compared to Pret and everybody else who's put their prices up 15% in that time. So then you start looking at it and thinking, wow, well, the only change I've noticed in the physical sense with Nando's is that there used to be a human being cooking the chicken, and now there's a robot holding it on the grill. And in fact, the robot's fingers that are inside the chicken are also checking the temperature. So not only do you not have a human contacting your food, but the thing that you have contacting your food is getting more data about your food serving it to you faster, serving it to you fresher, serving it to you with no chance or a much lower chance of E. coli and or any other things that could be influenced by a human being. So then human beings start going, actually, you know what? I never used to go to Nando's in 2017, but in 2021, it's not only good value for money, but actually when I look at the way they're putting my food together, it's interesting. Then what will happen, there'll be five years of that honeymoon period, and then they'll increase their prices with the rate of inflation and make all that margin that they remove the human beings. And with that kind of scheme, the kind of scheme that I would deploy if I was up there as well in those decision-making ranks, I don't know how a consumer is going to fight that shit. It, but it's, it's a choice. It's a philosophical choice. But consumers don't necessarily think of this. When you walk through, okay, let's go to Nando's in Kingsbury right now and ask, how, ask people right now, of your purchasing decision, how much of this was a philosophical choice versus... This whole Nando's experience being a gateway drug to you try and get some pussy tonight by bringing a girl here for a date. Like, there, there are, you know, I think when you start talking about the Tesla rankings, there are philosophical choices. But when you start thinking about grilled chicken, nuggets, fries, I don't know if consumers find themselves at that moral crossroad. But if they're losing jobs or know people who can't get jobs, then at some point there will be a fight back. 
it's like this Channel Four show, Humans, which is about these robots that you know kind of look like. Your fucking marketing team needs a, a chat there, don't they? Is it just called Humans? It's yeah, about because they, they they look so realistic, right? And they're, people call them dollies, and they're they. The great thing about this is it's very realistic, and you know people are resenting these dollies taking their jobs. Yeah. So they they start abusing these robots in the streets and all this kind of stuff, right. and, and fighting back and demonstrations and all this kind of stuff. These are things that are going to happen, mm. regardless of if it's a human-looking robot or not. You know. So th- there's the artificial intelligence question, which someone like Elon Musk has posed, saying, "Look, are we stupid enough to to make these people, these fucking robots, cleverer than us?" Yeah. yeah. You know. I said, I've said it before that we have to be really clever, uh, careful about these things. Mm. Imagine if you've got this 1%, they're hoarding all the wealth, and then they start hoarding all the technological know how and the defense resources. Say, for example, if Amazon start delivering things by drones, which they're already testing. Right? Sure. And um, after a couple of years, it's going really well. So they start replacing their delivery drivers because it's cheaper. Yeah? Mm. And, and, and okay, you've got drone operators, fine. Then you have self-driving drones. Then people start trying to like shoot them out of the sky so that they can get something from Amazon for free. Right? Sure. Then they say, okay, listen, you know, we've got a real problem. Um, we need to arm these drones. It's only self-defense. Just trust us. It's fine. People are like, yeah, that's fine. I mean, I want my, my Amazon Prime package delivered to me safely. It's fine. Arm the drones. I don't want some idiot looting it. Yeah. So now you've got a fleet of drones with fucking guns on them. Yeah. That you can't get out of the sky. That's you can't do anything about. And it's the discretion of a private company. Someone who, Jeff Bezos has got his eyes on the whole world. Mm. And, okay, that's just an example taking Amazon. Extrapolate that to anything, to rich people, who, instead of having security guards, have automated flying drones with guns on them. And you know that this will get approved if they give the government enough money. What are we going to do? A drone with a gun. S- I can't. I can't visualize. Okay, maybe it. not in maybe not in the UK. In yeah. America, just fucking wait. Give it ten years, it will happen. But what's the upside for the drone to kill a human being for the sake of a pair of Bose headphones? It's just, I, the economics just aren't there. But what, but you could say, well, that person was trying to steal. Sure. What's the upside of the but police in America? What's the upside of the police in America killing black people constantly? None. But the, if we compare apples to apples, but they get away with it. That's why there is an upside because they can do it with impunity, and uh, extrapolate that impunity to really rich people with flying drones that have no feeling. Yeah, and they can do what the fuck they want. I, I can't dig it because if you we, uh, tr- let me try and compare apples to apples, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. If we compare the pre-drone experience to buying a pair of Bose headphones, $300, if somebody went to a Best Buy or a Dixon's or whatever, wherever you're listening in the world, your kind of electrical store of choice, when somebody comes out to retrieve those headphones because someone's stolen it, you're not shooting that guy down. You're rugby tackling them or, hey, in, in some cases, you're not doing anything. And also, you don't also know when you shoot down a drone, <coughs> what you're getting from it. So there is this concept, you know, you're, you're an accountant, you're an economist, there's this concept of wastage. So actually, having somebody shoot down, having zero... What about zero, a Domino's zero, drone? You yeah. know there's pizza inside there. Right, but are you going to literally shoot a gun? Have you been to America? They've all got fucking guns there. Yeah. In this country, yeah, okay, tiny proportion of people have guns. But if, if in, just take, for example, America. Okay, maybe I've watched too many dystopian films. Yeah. But you, you can just I'm, just, I'm just sort of pushing the, the point along, just seeing, just provoking, just playing devil's advocate. Yeah. Right? If you can see 30 years down the line, people are really struggling for jobs. Yeah. What if you've got people who can't get jobs because of robots and then you see these drones flying past you, fuck it, I'll shoot it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I might have something in there, I can loot it. Yeah. People loot anyway, don't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even though there are, you know, security guards and cameras everywhere. Yeah. They still do it because they're driven to out of desperation. Yeah, yeah. Take the desperation that people are feeling now, 30 years down the line, when they can't get jobs. And if you're talking about something like a universal wage, are they really going to give us a universal wage once they've taken all our jobs? No, they're going to actually, in practical terms, give you just enough money to live. That's but, your universal wage. Exactly. It's, it's not, it's, it's like enough money to live. It's not enough money to live plus one holiday a year. And, and they, basically, it's kind of like the rich people get the middle classes to blame the poor, the, the, the poor people, right? That's yeah. what they do. Yeah. 
Yeah. So if you take that further down the line, then who's to know what's going to happen? Yeah. You know, I'm not trying to scare monger. I'm just, I'm just saying, look, these things could happen. Mix in artificial, artificial intelligence, robots taking our jobs, people losing all their money because they can't get a job and desperate times. Plus you've got the 1% who want to hoard all that power and money. How is, so let's, let's come back to like, you know, 2017, 2018 world. How is like apps like zero and stuff affected your, your world? So for those of you listening that don't own businesses, Zero is an app where you can just plug in a bunch of receipts and it basically does the bookkeeping layer that needs to be done prior to going to a qualified accountant to sign it off. Have you seen, has there been a fallout? There hasn't been any fallout for us whatsoever. As Why, of, as Why of is that, dude? Well, because we do tax as well. Okay, we, so, we so you're talking about tax. your business. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. For other accountants, I'm definitely noticing a fallout. Real, yeah. Yeah. But then the thing is, is that tax is going to become much more specialized and um, the robots are coming for my job too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but this is, this is what I mean is that some people want to face a human, you know, they don't want all their information and advice from a robot or from the internet. True. And they, they thrive on human interaction and something, you know, someone's going to explain something to you better. They'll hold your hand. They'll say, look, this is what I can do for you. Yeah. Okay, the robot or computer program or software, whatever, might do it a bit cheaper, but you have to do all the work. And, you know, we have 50 years of expertise, whatever, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Now keep pushing that kind of line of thought, yeah? Another 10 years down the line, then another 20. What's going to happen? Ratio, mechanics ratio mechanics is going to be out of jobs. Yeah. yeah. Countless numbers of mechanics, yeah. you know? Well, you've already seen that as well. One of my girls, Priam, who's, who is at Amazon, I'm having lunch with her on Friday there, she was telling me that she, her dad, who had a Tesla, downloaded a firmware update. And I was like, oh, don't, what does the firmware update do? And she goes, the car drives itself. A firmware update for a car, bro. The fundamental hardware doesn't change, but they rewire the firmware. And for those of you listening, firmware, as far as I know, it is the, is the interface between software and hardware, right? It's a little bit of tweaking of the hardware. It's a little bit of tweaking of the software. And it kind of allows them to relate to each other and enhance each other more, right? Yeah, basically. So the firmware, there's a firmware update. I was like, what's it do? She goes, now the car drives itself. I was like, motherfucker, that is some dope shit. Yeah, <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. I mean, I'm a Tesla shareholder, so I know a lot about this stuff. When did you buy in? At the perfect point. Um, I literally read a biography of Elon Musk. It was last November or something like mm -hmm. that. And I was like, wow, I really believe in this guy all of a sudden. And the share price had been like kind of in this, this sort, of, sort of treading water for a long time. Sure. As soon as I bought, after that week, something happened and then it just kept going up and up. Since then, it's doubled, basically. Shit. In less than a year. Shit. Uh, it was just, I can't even claim credit for it. I wasn't like a sort of soothsayer or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. It was just, I read the biography. I thought, yes, I believe in this person. I can see what he's trying to do. Yeah. And then I bought into it. Well, it's doubled since then, which is great. You win some, you lose some. Well, well, tell me about some losses then. Uh, I had a really bad one, which was Fitbit. Fuck yeah. So I, I think me and you might have had a conversation when you were pro Fitbit. Yeah, I was pro Fitbit. That might have been the last time we hung out. Yeah. Okay. And, and then we all know what happened there. Like wearables as, a, as an ecosystem, we're just not able to, to get their product customer fit right. The irony is Fitbit could, they still sell a lot. Yeah. And they could be the market leader, but yeah. they've just messed it up. Yeah. The, the people running the company have not done a good job. The people manufacturing Fitbits have not done a good job. The software experience isn't quite good enough. It's good, but not good enough. And, um, and Apple watches are going to become huge. And mm. Android watches have fallen off a cliff. They've messed that up. You know, the only, the only real competition is, is uh, Samsung Watch, which I've got on right now, which yeah, is yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah which is Sorry, amazing. so good thing you carried on talking. I was going to say I'm seeing a lot of pro Android watch talk as pertains to the Samsung. So, yes, it's the Samsung. But the Samsung doesn't run Android. It runs Samsung's own operating system called Tizen. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't run Android. Mm -hmm. Because Android, they're, they're, I don't know, they've just messed it up. I have no idea. Like Android, the phone operating system is on over 80% of the phones in the world. Yeah. It's like a whole Windows versus Mac thing all over again. Oh, no, it's Android beating the shit out of iOS. Like... Obviously, I spend most of my time east of the United Kingdom. And of course, in London and, I don't know, Barcelona, Paris, 
Atlanta, LA, it's all about iPhone, right? It's the mm. premium products. Dude, the moment you trip any further east than fucking Spain and Portugal, like it's Android, bro. Yeah. It's Android all the way. And kind of the darker you go skin color wise, the more you are Android. <laughs> because I went to India like three times last year. I went to Mumbai three times last year. I was in India for that quite some time. Unless you're like super elite rich, people aren't really fucking with the iPhone like that. Like people like Android and people are embedded into Android because they made apps for very nuanced use cases, right? Yeah, because like, anybody like can Kadrati build. lunar calendars and so, Hinduism and shit like that. Because or, there's enough Indian developers out there, all that kind of stuff. And it's all free. I mean, it'd be like acidity in the rain in Ahmedabad. Like it'll be some fucked up shit. Exactly. That's so niche that Apple aren't going to fuck with it. And actually publishing it for Apple for a bunch of farmers that do not use Apple devices doesn't make sense. So there's a lot of, you know, when you look at that, the Porter's five forces thing, there was a lot of like supply, demand, need. It was all perfect for Android. And actually, I think we've seen it now with the S8 Plus and S8 and Note 8 that people are really now starting to, like, yo, I just bought one, bro, me. I just bought an S8 Plus. It's somewhere around the house right now. I, admittedly, it doesn't have a SIM card in it. I don't use it as a, like, telecommunications device. But when it's on Wi-Fi, I use it for Facebook Messenger. Right. The thing that I fuck with the most is you can plug in a USB-C, like... On the go. On the go. Yeah. And it's got a file manager. Yeah. So I literally go click, plug it in, open the hard drive, which could be 128 gigabyte, you know, and there's... Then you can put 128 gigabyte stick inside it. Yeah. With memory. And for someone like me who's constantly carrying around content, showing people, you know, videos and shit that I've made, that shit is a dream versus iPhone, which is, let me go to my gallery. Let me fucking scroll past a whole bunch of dubious videos that I've made <laughs> to show one fucking corporate video that's like, you know, it's just like, I fuck with Android, man. I think the fact that it now occupies part of my headspace, I probably use my Android device once for every 14 times that I use my iPhone. But yo, man, the first leap, right, is the significant one. Yeah, I mean, I switched... You've always been pro-Android. No, not always. Not always. I was on iPhone for five years. Yeah. And then eventually I, I switched to Android. And I'm still kind of like, I, 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 the apps that I get are agnostic, platform agnostic. So if I wanted to switch back and forth, there's basically no problem. True, yeah. The thing is, is everything you're saying is correct, but Apple don't care. Because Apple makes so much money. So if you've got to... Think of it this way. Apple basically don't do anything unless they can make 35% profit, clear profit on anything, whether it's an app, whether it's uh, hardware like the iPhone, iPad, MacBook, anything like that. Mm. The iPhone is their big cash cow, for mm. sure. Mm. So you've got to think of it this way. If you're going out and paying um, $1,000 for an iPhone 10, which is just about to come out, right? it doesn't cost them anything near that to make it. In reality, it costs them about maybe $300, $400 to make it. Then they cost in their advertising, their marketing, the R&D, all that kind of stuff. So basically, they're taking home out of $1,000, they're taking home, what, $350 at least, minimum. After costs. Yeah. Yeah. So they won't do it unless they can make that amount of money, 35%, which is a huge, huge profit margin. Have you bought Apple stock? Yes, I, I am a stock... Uh, I'm a shareholder in Apple. Yeah. Yeah. I timed that pretty well as well, actually, because yeah. like, they had a sort of major dip, like about, what, 18 months ago. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, so so right now, we're in kind of, what, October 2017. Mm -hmm. They've got over $250 billion in cash. Yeah. Yeah, just lying around. So that's a quarter of a trillion in cash reserves. There is no Android manufacturer who's got anything like that. And no one makes those margins. Samsung don't make those kind of margins at yeah, all. Yeah, nothing. Um, so it, it, it's kind of like, this is what, it's kind of like what I was saying before, you know, you're going to have this, this world for rich people and you're going to have a world for everyone else. Yeah. It's going that way. And Android is a massive representation of that. You know, you can get an Android device. You can pick up an Android device for like 80, 80 quid. Oh, like less, a, you, you can get like a, a, a seven inch tablet that does 98% of what the iPad does for 80 quid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, obviously, there'll be differences and this and that and blah, blah, blah. But if you just want, or like an Amazon Fire, they're constantly doing these tablets and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. Like 50 quid, whatever. We'll give it to you. Who gives a shit? You can get all of that stuff. If you want to get online, do all that kind of stuff. And Android is the way, mm. you know. 
if you've got money or I don't know, they're kind of hooked on it in America for some reason. Yeah. Like one of my friends, he's uh, he's in America. He's got an Android phone, and uh, he started seeing this girl. Well, they kind of met through the internet, or whatever, and then they swapped phone numbers, and they were texting each other, and uh, and it didn't go to that that blue iMessage color. It went to the green text color. Sure. She was like, "What kind of phone have you got?" He was like, "I've got an Android phone." And this is like the best Android. This is like a Samsung S8. Yeah. Right. And uh, and she was like, "You're an Android, okay? Bye. That's it." Whoa. She was like, I, "I don't fuck with someone who hasn't got." You can't even afford an iPhone. Wow. So the levels of kind of ignorant, and that's not an isolated incident. That Honestly, I've heard that happens a lot. I don't know if this is a market-shaping incident. I, so, but I get where, I kind of get where she's coming from because I've still got the iPhone snobbery about me. And, you know, let me tell you how much I paid for my iPhone. No, hold on. Let me tell you how much I paid for my Samsung S8 Plus, which is an animal. I paid £600 offline. Mm. for it I bought it in Dubai admittedly during a week of tech sales right where the whole city was doing crazy electrical deals I got this JBL Flip 4 behind us behind me retail value £8,200 I got the gear uh, not the gear I got the the VR kit I think it's called the gear the gear 3 the latest one retail value £9,200 I got the uh 128 gigabyte card, 80 megabyte transfer speed with the adapter, retail 40 pounds. I got an additional uh, USB charge cable, probably about eight pounds. Um, and I got a meal for two in the Burj Al Arab. <laughs> so probably around a third plus of my retail value, I got in goodies and freebies. And And I'm one of the fortunate people who works in a world whereby the more robust your mobile device, the more easy your work life is. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's not as if I bought it to show off. Like, I bought it because I'm like, your work, bitch. Like, you're here to do my shit for me. Um, you should get a notate. Then. I don't for know. For someone like you, like a content creator and all that kind of stuff, I, I think that would be... The, the S8 is basically the same thing. But the no, S8 Plus no, is similar. The no, uh, yeah, the S8 Plus, rather. Yeah. The notate has a stylus. I can imagine you doing all your doodling and shit on Instagram yeah, yeah. and Snapchat. But... I mean, they're basically the same thing. Yeah, there was, there was like a $200, $200 price differential. And I thought, fuck it. Mm. You know, and I really thought I would do a lot more, like, especially now that Instagram and Snapchat, they allow you to use the pens. I thought I'd do a lot more, but I don't do very much. The other day I posted that, like, thank you for being my friend. And I used my fingertip and I was like fucking bored of it straight away. You know, by scribbling it mm. on the Instagram thing. So I don't know, man. Like, it was like, I think it's a useful device, but it's, you know, one is way more practical. The Samsung is way more function. And then the iPhone is way more fashion. That being said, I've got an iPhone 6, which is just the last generation of iPhones that don't work with fucking shit right now. Like iPhone 6S has still got a fucking snowflake chance in hell, but the 6... I hear that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm definitely not upgrading to iOS 11. You know you've got a problem in your ecosystem when your own users are telling other users do not upgrade to the latest software. Mm. So I don't know. I mean, that. with that, Android has its own problems. I mean... How Samsung's are not going to get the latest software update for at least like another three, four months or something. Yeah. Which would make it like nine months or something crazy like that. But, but again, if I'm only using it for Instagram, yeah. Facebook Messenger, will this it make a thing. difference? This is the thing is people are paying all these exorbitant amounts and, and they're just using it for like the same 10 apps, basically. Yeah, yeah. In which case, the only differentiator is the fashion and the camera, uh, like basically. Yeah. The battery life's crap and all of them. So, you know, people have Yo, to be a th- bit... 3500 MAH. On the Just, S8 Plus, it's yeah. fucking good. It, that being said, I've never put a SIM card inside it, so I don't know. Yeah, exactly. In if you're using it as, as like an offline device, of course it's going to be good. It's not yeah. doing anything. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing is that, so basically last week, I got a Samsung uh, Gear VR, the latest one with the controller. Yeah, I got that, yeah. Yeah. And also the Samsung Gear 360. Which is that the camera? Yeah. So it's got I was two gonna lenses. Buy that. Yeah, 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 two yeah, lens. yeah, yeah. I was actually going to bring it tonight. I completely forgot. That shit would have been dope. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can do loads of things. You can do live streaming. You can do 360 videos, all this kind of stuff. So basically, uh, it was sitting there for a couple of weeks. Then I, I pulled it out on um, on the weekend. So it was actually Diwali. And uh, I bought some fireworks. And we went around to my in-law's house and stuff, my little son. And uh, set off these fireworks. And I filmed, I filmed the whole thing with the Gear 360. Yeah. And I hadn't used it before. So it was still a bit clunky with it. But I thought, okay, let's just see what it does. 
and obviously the quality at night and stuff like that. It was 4K, but you know there wasn't a lot of light and stuff. But I filmed it, took it home, and then I slotted my phone into the Gear VR, and it was absolutely magical. Like if you can just sort of distance yourself from the resolution and the practicalities of all this kind of technology right now, you put on this the, the Gear VR thing, put in your headphones, and then I was just standing there looking around me, literally just turning around in the living room. And I could see the look on my son's face as he saw fireworks for the first time. And everyone's just talking around me. And you just look up and you see the fireworks. You look down, you see my son. And and then you see my mother-in-law and this and that, all this kind of stuff. And for two minutes, it was literally like I was there. It was unbelievable. I thought, if this is the point that where you're at, where, where the resolution is still pretty limited and stuff, thanks to the phone, there are technological limitations, all this kind of stuff. But if you just go down five years, 10 years, and think of this kind of stuff, like, you know, if you gave this to to an Alzheimer's patient, yeah, in 50 years time, if they've recorded this on their 360, and they could actually just immerse themselves in in, in this world, and then the the tech gets better, etc, etc. It's absolutely magical. I was blown away by it. I absolutely was. So if you gave your camera a seat at the table at your Diwali meal? Exactly. And now you can just be... Anybody just yeah, sat at the Diwali meal. Exactly. And, and when you're actually watching it, you can just turn around, physically turn around and, and look at people and listen to people and all this kind of stuff. And then and I did, we did another one with sparklers. He'd never held a sparkler before. And I'm watching him and, and looking down and then looking at my wife saying, oh, be careful. And then looking down at him. All the, and it was just, Shit. it was absolutely incredible. And maybe there was a bit of license there because it was dark and, and the resolution didn't matter as much. And stuff mm-hmm. like that. But I don't care. It's about the emotional resonance that you feel with this thing. And actually how, where, where you'll be at maybe 75, 80 years old. Yeah. And you're like, man, this fucking kid moved out 20 years ago. And he's like, <laughs> he's doing his thing now. But like, I need to feel that moment of giving this boy his first sparkler. Yeah. And, and it's just, you know what? Sometimes like you, you look at marketing campaigns and things like that. And, that, you know, they're saying, oh, they're trying to humanize all this technology and stuff like that. Mm. It's really up to the user. You know, Samsung are just a consumer electronics company. Mm. Yeah. They make washing machines. They make TVs, this, that. But what you can do with it is what matters. And so that's why you have, you have to think, okay, what can I do with this? How will this actually enrich my human experience? And, and it really did. I have to say that it was amazing. It doesn't mean I'm going to use it for everything all the time and stuff like that. But, True. but yeah, I, I just, I keep saying that word magical. I don't I sound like a fucking Apple keynote now or yeah. something, but it, it really was incredible. It really was amazing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So basically... That kind of leads me on on to what my thesis for this podcast was going to be about, All right. which I, I told the listener about when you were dishing out the food. Okay. Which I'm still recording. Go ahead. Which sorry, I'm... listeners. I keep fucking the flow up. Sorry, listeners. I'm still eating. Jesus. <laughs> sorry, man. That's also my fault because no, 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 I, fucking, no. I kept throwing you the ball for no, no, the first no. hour. That's okay. So, so basically, I came up with this thesis uh, a few months ago about... Now, so both, both you and I, we're both British Asian, both come from... Kind of sim- not similar backgrounds, but in terms of we've gone through very, very many shared experiences or similar experiences, mm. and we're both quite unconventional. So over the last three months, I've been kind of like, I guess every now and then, every 10 years, you need to look at your life and think about what you're going to do, your principles, your sort of ambitions, all this kind of stuff. And then whether it's justifying it or just trying to put a roadmap ahead for yourself, you've got to think about what you can do, right? Yeah. And I realized that I was living my life in, re- in reverse, effectively. So the kind of standard... So you've been shitting yourself every night and then basically asking someone to change your underwear. No, it's not like Benjamin Button. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what I mean is that effectively there is the standard Asian brown print that has been handed down to us. Yeah. I love that brown print, by the way. So you've got to do this. You've got to do this at this time. Yeah. You yeah. go to school. Yeah. You go to university. You get a job. You find a girl, settle down, blah, 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 have some kids, all this kind of stuff. And you do this, 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 this. And, and it's, it's kind of like, it's actually quite a modern one because our parents, you know, weren't born in this country. I don't think yours were. No. Mine weren't. So Nairobi and Mombasa. Hey, man, exactly the same. I Nairobi know. and Mombasa. I expect nothing else when we fucking share facts. <laughs> so ridiculous. for the listener who's wondering why we're each other's spirit animal, it's because that moment has happened. Since the time we first met. And by the way, if there was one thing I wanted to talk about was the story of us meeting, but we'll come to that in a bit. So you were talking about the brown print. So the brown print, volume three. Yeah. And um, 
and, and I've kind of gone against it. I didn't realize until the last kind of three months I've been looking at my life. I think the thing is, is we've got very different parents, right? Clearly, because we're not related in that way. But <laughs> your, you said that yours were very supportive and they were always kind of like your cheerleaders and they were really supportive and everything like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mine have been supportive in very different ways and they've been very critical in lots of other ways, which has manifested itself into my personality. Fine, whatever. I, you know, I'm sort of, I, I, I don't know what your parents were like, but mine at various critical junctures in my life were like, you're a failure, you're a failure, you're a failure, all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Because they had expectations that society had told them or they thought or, you know, they'd sort of invested into me as if I was some sort of fucking annuity or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. They did the best they could. Yeah. yeah. But at a certain point, you have to just take ownership of your own life, right? I think, okay, I'm going to do this. It might not please everyone. Fuck it. It's my life. Whatever. So I realized anyway, basically, okay, I did go to school. I did do my GCSEs. I did do my A-levels. Then I went to university. And... Basically, I, I was doing English at university, and that's where I learned to DJ. And the DJing really hooked me in. Then I ended up going to a different university to do business studies. And all along, in my 20s, I kind of focused on things that people traditionally don't focus on, effectively. So it's kind of like people get on this train, and they don't get off until they're retired, right? Life passes them by. They haven't made enough time for the right things. If they're lucky, you know, they meet someone, have kids and stuff like that, but they're not fully engaged in it because they're still on this train. Yeah. And you just can't get off until they retire. And then suddenly they find all this time and they start doing the things they love, except they're like fucking 68. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they haven't got the energy to do the things that they actually wanted to do. Right. So you need to plot your life out properly and think, okay, where do I have the energy to do this thing that no one else would even conceive of? At what age do I have to do this? And then in my 30s, what do I do then? And then in my 40s, what am I going to do then? In my 50s, 60s, all these kind of things. And I realized that I'm completely doing the opposite to basically pretty much all of my friends. And, and even to the extent of things like I, I placed a lot of emphasis on finding the right girl and getting married and then ended up getting married like five years before anyone else that I knew pretty much, all that kind of stuff. What age? I got married at 29. And, and none of my friends got married until they were like basically 33 But that would be your friends though. I'd say the 29 is almost the perfect age to get married. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's my peer group. That's my experience, right? Yeah. And then a lot of my friends kind of were on that slog in their 20s doing things they didn't want to do. I was DJing. I was a full-time professional DJ. Mm. And then in my 30s, I've now taken the complete opposite road where I'm working less to look after my family more or spend time with my family more. Mm. Because that's time that you're never going to get back. Like True. that that experience that I was talking about with the, the Samsung thing, the virtual reality thing. You take that and times it by 200 every day. Mm. Yeah, that's what I'm experiencing with my children. You know, I, I mean, I'm even I've even taken a day, a day off every week now wow. to spend with my kids. Because the thing is, is that, that, and this is my point. In my 40s, yeah, once the kids are at school and they're on that train, mm. I can go out and make more money. True. But until that point, I can't. Yeah. And then I want to, I'm just trying but to until think Until that ahead. point, you can, but you choose not to because this is the way you've set your priorities. But this is the thing. And, and the funny thing is, is that people are constantly asking, oh, why are you so happy? It's because I worked at it. And then I came up with a set of principles and I decided to my, at certain points in my life to do certain things and make certain decisions. And not everything's worked out how I thought it would, but... In contrast to what it could have been, I'm incredibly happy. Yeah. And the other thing is, is that I'm, it, these are important things. There's nothing more important than family and friends and that time. Yeah. Right. And these are luxuries. Now, if, if you've got to walk eight miles a day for water and you're on the poverty line and all that kind of stuff, I'm not talking about that. You know, I'm talking about if you're in our kind of privileged situation where we're not struggling like that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's just an interesting thesis. I kind of realized I was like, pe- people kind of like, they work all their life so they can stop working and then do what they want to do. What if you just started doing what you want to do and then carried on and just see where that takes you? Mm. And then you can just take time off. Yeah, it's almost like an early retirement or, or kind of working half a job or something so you can spend time with the people who need it most, who are these little bloody children. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. 
and and then you can see them grow and you can influence them and teach them the right things you know my son could read before he was three wow yeah and we've suddenly realized he's like three and a half now we've suddenly realized none of his friends can read or write right. or they're just learning all these things he can read entire books he can read the newspaper fuck me yeah and people are like, oh, how? You know, he must be a natural. It's like, we spent a lot of time with him. Yeah, yeah. You know, he doesn't watch television. He doesn't know how to work an iPhone or an iPad. Yeah, yeah. You know, he loves books. Yeah, yeah. My second kid doesn't appear to be that way. He, was, he, he <laughs> completely <laughs> appears to be completely different. That's fine. But I notice that because I spend time with him. Yeah, yeah. So well, how, do you a... spe- how do you spend time? Isn't time the most precious commodity? Yeah, but I think there's a lot of variables 99% of which are unreplicatable that allowed you to be that way. So for all the criticism your parents gave you and all the praise they gave you, that combo, plus being lucky to be born East African Asian. You know the thing about this, let me say, let me talk about this. Like, and, and, and I think this really is something that me, you, and so many people with Harrow in their postcode benefit from, right? We are a particular breed, East African Asians, right? What would you say is our biggest advantage? I had this fucking huge epiphany recently. It's something I wanted. It's something that if we didn't record the podcast night and we just sat on the couch, I'd have just talked to you about it. It's a big couch, by the way. We wouldn't have been too fucking cozy. But like, think, what is our, what is the proportionate elements in our cocktail that makes it so easy for us to be privileged and successful? I literally had this conversation about four hours ago with the Tesco's delivery guy. Who's now become a friend? <laughs> Thanks. Because he is. Pass me, on, pass me a glass, real quick. So I'll okay. just half burn. Okay. Uh, that's it. That's it. Thank you. Right. Right. So uh, like, his his name is Nainesh. Yeah. And uh, he's Gujarati, and he's East African. Yeah. And um, he was literally having this conversation with me about four hours ago, and, mm. and he said, "Look, the biggest benefit." the biggest advantage to being of East African descent mm. is that you can put us anywhere and we'll make it work. We are adaptable. Yeah, why? <sighs> he didn't go into that. Okay, I'm going to tell you what it is. Go on then. This is probably the greatest thing. I've, and I've not said it much. I won't talk to you. Like, I, I test drive these things before I say them on stage or in interviews, right? But the fucking golden combination, the winning lottery ticket for East African Asians is this. We were, we moved with the British. So for those of you listening that are not East African Asian, our story is roughly, if you look at the last three generations, in our generation, people like me and Jessel were born in the UK. Our parents' generation were born in East Africa, which at the time that they were born was ran by the British. And our grandparents' generation were born in India at the time that they were born was also ran by the British. So if you look at the knowledge that's passed down in that very tiny window between grandparent to child, we have knowledge in us as human beings today, right, of being under British rule in our own country. Then they give us the country back in inverted commas, and they take us to another country where they rule a different race of people. And we learn that system. Then they bring us to their own country and we see how they are in their own country. So we got to see British people and the British system in effect in our own country where we are the dominant race and we were dominated over. Then we went to another country that doesn't belong to us or the British and saw how they were dominant over that. So it's like hyper objectivity. And then we came into the mouth of the lion. And if you give three generations of experiences, if you give, three, if you give those experiences to three generations, especially where, you know, thank through grace of God, I was able to sit on my granddad's lap for many of my formative years, right, until I was an adult and still talk to him and learn shit. That's a lot of motherfucking knowledge to get. And that gives you an advantage in life, especially if you're hacking the British or American or Canadian system, which are which are quite similar, right? So that's my thing, is that we were, as, as tough as we've had it for many, many generations, We understand the British. So in our parents' generation, opening a corner shop was easy because of what their parents told them about the British in India and what they learned about the British in Africa. So coming to the UK and opening a corner shop was easy. And then for us to go to a British school, because we could come home and read, in my case, corner shop story, right? 
could go home and read Smash Hits magazine or Top Gear magazine or, you know, like what all, all that shit. We become used to the terms and the, the morals and the values and the, the ethics of, of British culture. So when we go to school, we assimilate a lot quicker with white people. So therefore we can talk and have banter as they call it nowadays, right? So when we go for interviews, we're a lot more fluid, which means that we've got more opportunities. So that's our superpower is three generations of being around the British in three very separate scenarios, each one rich in the knowledge that it affords us. So basically you're saying that our superpower is assimilation. I'm saying that... Or or you're saying that it's that inherent knowledge. I'm saying that our advantage is the set of circumstances we found ourselves in. And the fact that each generation, short generation, was able to transfer the knowledge up and down very quickly. My granddad told me about the British in India. My dad told me about the British in Africa. That must have shaped how I, what they call life hack today, as I moved through British society. You know, I used to freak out all the time. And my dad used to call, his name's Dilip, right? And you know how it was in the 70s and 80s, white people aren't trying to say the word Dilip, they'd say Philip. So they'd say Phil. So I used to freak out because I used to listen to Public Enemy and all that black power shit. I'd be like, why the fuck do you let them call you Phil? And he just never used to answer me. Probably because he realized that this answer for this nine-year-old or 11-year-old would be too complex. It was basically being like, look, I'm playing the fucking game and I'm showing you how to play the game. You know, you might not realize it yet, but by letting them get away with calling me Phil for 20 years, it's going to give you an advantage where they will always call you Raj. Mm. Motherfuckers tried to call me Ray when I was at school because the J looks like a Y. Yeah. So he used to try and call me Ray and I was like, you ain't calling me fucking Ray. Like, that's not my name. Like, there's a bit of resentment and the fact that my dad had his name, you know, western Yeah. So, but where would that confidence come from? So that's our power. Why is it me and you walk around like some cocky motherfuckers today? Like, in any scenario. There's no one small bitty shitty town in the UK or any major metro city like London or otherwise that we don't fucking win. That's not just talking shit. But I like, think we're also really lucky because of the age group we were born into. There's another thing that I massively think. If we'd been four years older, yeah, we would have been too British. If we'd been four years younger, we would have been too Asian. I say opposite, bro. There's I don't know. We're, we're in a sweet spot where we have seen so much. We've seen, even if you think technologically, you know, we went from vinyl to cassette to um, CDs to MP3s and then back to vinyl again or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And, and then, you know, when we were growing up, we had four television channels. In fact, we could probably remember when Channel 4 started broadcasting. Maybe, I don't know. No, I agree with things. you. Like, we, 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 bent, we definitely drank from the well of analog. Like, we did that for sure. But in terms of, like, I just wanted to focus on this, what you just said. If we were four years older, we'd be more British. If we were four years younger, we'd be more Asian. I would say it's the opposite because I'm 37. I know 42-year-olds that were encouraged to marry who they were introduced to. Mm. And I know people four years younger than me right now that cannot fathom the concept And everybody in my specific age group, call it 36 to 38, batted one of two ways, you know? Some of the people that are 37 were introduced and told to get married. Other people were like, fucking love marriage, married someone from a different caste or a different race. It's all good. But I think the people above us experience, like if I look at my older cousins, they even tell me with that five to eight year gap that they're like, no shit was different in our generation. They literally think about themselves as a different generation to us. And I think it's because for us, Windows 96 or Windows 95 when we were 15, you know, fucking putting together CVs, going for different jobs. It's it's because that happened at that formative time for us, 15 to 20. Mm. The tech revolution, the The exposure, the internet, Mm. mobile motherfucking phones, you know, one-to-one free calls after seven, all that shit. We, bro, if if you were born in 1980, that's the fucking lottery ticket. But you know what I'm talking about? What? I'm talking about, and this is going to go deep, right? Yeah. That's what I'm so, so, so this might offend some certain people. Yeah. Okay. But but basically, I look at certain people that I know, yeah, and I think you have an inferiority complex about being brown in a white man's country. Because, yeah. And, and and like I'm talking about, I haven't seen that much with people our age group or younger. I've seen it with countless people above us in that generation above us, like you were saying, like even like two to five years above us. Yeah. And they don't feel comfortable enough to be themselves. They feel they have to put on certain airs and graces or put on a posh accent talking to someone who was a school, a private school, or a cockney accent to someone who drives a taxi. Like that. Mm. It's so fluid. 
They're too fluid. Mm. They can't be themselves. Now, that, that's not just a trait that you can attribute because of they're brown. But what if they are themselves? What if Cockney is a culture and they assimilated into it the way that... I know this brown guy, bro. My man's name is Steve. And he is the most Cockney dude. If you spoke to him on the phone, you'd literally be like, oh, is this the casting for EastEnders? Like, he's so Cockney. But that's his culture. But me and you talk hip-hop. Like, they're in us. Yeah. When we were 16 to 26, you know we used to throw around American slang terms. Like, we just fucking came out of Shaolin. What up, Dan? Yeah, what up, Dan? Like, what up, God? Like, I was, I was all the way wrong with it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So what if that is just them? Like, but, but that's kind of like trying on a costume, right? Or putting a hat on or whatever like that. And then it becomes a part of you over time where you take little bits of it. I'm talking about where you don't have the confidence to be yourself and you feel that you have to like morph into a different personality just to fit in and have recognition or respect from someone else. Whereas you and I like, fuck that shit. You're going to talk to me. You're going to respect me. I am me. I'll say what the fuck I want. Yeah. yeah. I haven't heard you break out of your Mancunian accent ever. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Or, or even, or even like sort of go up and down the class levels or anything like that. Yeah, I've never heard you do that ever. But if you once. see, if you see me in a boardroom where I'm trying to get a bunch of white people by the balls, I do. Like, I don't fake it. I'm just like, look, don't think that I don't speak your language. But if that's you need... different. You're talking business speak. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about when you adapt your personality full stop. Yeah. Because you don't feel confident in your upbringing or who you are or okay, what so you've you, been through. Right. So you just go one way with it. Would you, would you, would you just like stop being Raj and would you be Ray? No. Exactly. Right. And that's the difference. Yeah. See, my, my, we talked about generational contributions towards our demographics broad superpower. But my superpower, and I would guess yours as well if we, if we hung out in different countries, is that I can go to Inglewood, have gone to Inglewood with Crips. I've hung out with shakes. Like, it's all good. It's all fucking good. They all fuck with you. And the adaption that we make is not a permanent adaption or adaptation, whatever the right word is. Like, I don't go all the way like I talk to a shake 24-7 when I'm walking around Hatch End. And I don't go all the way like I'm talking to Crips in Inglewood when I'm walking around Hatch End. Like, we just, we, we, we dial it up and we dial it down as, as we need to. Not for ourselves to make ourselves feel like we fit in that community, but to actually make the other community feel good. That's the reason why I do it. When I keep it so hood and so gangster when I'm around hood people, it's not because I want to be that way. It's because if I was my natural self, they'd feel like shit. Like, is this guy trying to talk down to me? I'm talking to them in a way whereby, look, I have empathy with the way that you are. I understand your your syntax, your lexicon. I, I, I get it. And that part of me is that. If you let me go back to my average and just let my needle float back to where it's meant to be, it's somewhere in between, you know? We can go Bloomberg and we can go straight fucking UMTV raps. It's, it's, no, it's no problem. But you're talking about people that have basically committed to one and kept it there. No, I'm not talking about that. I don't get it then. Fuck. No, no, the, then, then it's basically what you're saying is about finding common ground between your kind of average and then when you're going somewhere that's completely out of your normal. Yeah. Yeah. You find the common ground. That's absolutely fine. The difference is, is that if you put on an affected, affected, an entire personality just to be accepted by those people, mm -hmm. yeah, because you didn't have the confidence to let your own self shine through. It's different if you're just dropping in a few hood words here and there and finding common ground to relate to. Yeah. I'm talking about when you don't have the confidence to be yourself. That's the difference. And what, what's I realise it's a murky ground, and maybe I'm explaining it really. No, badly. but what, what's the what's the punchline though? Does it does does it upset you? Do you wish better for these people? Like, what's the how how is this playing out for you? The, th the thing is, is that when it goes into your personal life, that's the problem. Yeah, when you can't be yourself around yourself because you don't know who you are, and that's what I've seen with certain people. They put on so many hats that they, when they take when they come home, they don't know who they are anymore. And right. that's the difference. Right. Which I don't think is you. And it's fucking well not me. I know who I am. Yeah, yeah. You know? But this is my point, is that I spent years learning who I was. You know, I went through a breakdown. I learned and rebuilt myself. I learned about spirit, spirituality. I really, all this fucking mindfulness stuff and this and that and blah, blah, blah. It's hilarious because people are doing it in their late 30s because they need to. Yeah. Yeah. No one thought... Okay, if I do this when I'm 20, this might set me up for life and give me a blueprint of how I should be 
and give me a set of spiritual guides as well as like, you know, financial, like, like I, I wasn't good financially until like my late twenties because I, which is ironic because my dad could have taught us everything, but chose not to for mm-hmm. some reason, you know, but then I can't put it all on him. I should have thought to seek things out myself, you know, so what you need is to develop your own systems. Yeah. Where it's financial, spiritual, family, friendship, passions, this, that, whatever it is. But you need to do these things earlier on and then keep tweaking it as you go along in life. The problem is, is when you reach certain points and you think, yeah, I'm the fucking only sort of person in this village. And you think, yeah, I'm 38 now. I've just learned about mindfulness. Have you heard about life mindfulness? Have you gone to hot yoga? And you think you're the only person doing it. (laughs) Yeah. You don't realize, yeah, mindfulness is basically what's been going on for 5,000 years. Yeah, Yeah. Right. Probably longer. But now that's immaterial. The, the point is, is basically you've got to find out a way to be happy. Yeah. For you and I, we're in privileged positions. Our job is learning how to be happy. And this is where people are failing. Sorry, I, I don't mean to use the word fail. This is where they're just kind of like not realizing the importance, the importance of but, so when you need to you, learn how to be happy at an early stage. But are you not happy with the fact that people are late to the party? Like I have this one girl who I talk to. She's big on mindfulness. She talks to me a lot about it. She's dropping jewels on me about mindfulness. Whereas you know, and I know because we, you know, we fuck with each other. I had whooping cough a while ago, right? Mm, yeah. And whooping cough and a, basically an insane addiction to girls led me down a very, 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 very bad path. And at the other side of it, I was like, "Fuck it, let me try this yoga shit." For hyper practical biological reasons, i.e. My lungs are not opening the way they used to. They're damaged. The only way I can open up my lungs is by doing tactical breathing, breathing that's for the benefit of my whole body and as a byproduct of my lungs. And I did yoga, stumbled into meditation and thought, actually, this is fucking awesome. Because now when I'm in a boardroom or when I'm in a negotiation, it's the mindfulness that's helping me slow the chat down, get in between the nooks and crannies and find my weak point where I can get the deal to go in my favor. I feel anyway. Mm. Um, I, and I still get people that are now, you know, yeah, 35, 32, 30, 40, they're like, yo, have you thought about mindfulness? But part of being mindful is being okay with the fact that they got to the party late. Are you not okay with the fact that they got to the party late? It's got nothing to do with the party. It's got nothing to do with being late. There are things that I don't know anything compared to what there is to know in this world. Mm. I'll, I'll not even be late. I'll never even be invited to this party. I'll never find it. So are you mad about, not mad, I don't want to say that, but are you, it's the point that you're highlighting that some people are not self-aware enough at such a late stage in life that it's to their own detriment. But these kind of people, there's a, there's still hope for them that they'll figure I'm, it out. No, right? no, no. Listen, I'm not saying someone who's 35 is late or, or a hopeless cause. Yeah. You know, they're probably not even halfway through their life yet. Yeah. Got yeah. yeah. But this is the point. They don't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like we're a goldfish. Yeah. And we're swimming in a pond. And we don't realize that there is a whole sky above us. We don't realize there's land just there because it's immaterial to us. Now, for a goldfish to make the jump from that to a land-breathing creature is like this gigantic evolutionary leap yeah, of thought, of conception, of physical change. And the thing is, there are certain points in our life we have to make these leaps just to learn how to be happy. Because this life is now... It's a fixed game. It's a rigged game where you're not going to be happy. And it's only getting worse for these kids, thanks to the internet, social media, all these kind of things. They are being brainwashed and they're being sort of basically put on this, this railroad. Yeah. And it's only going to get worse for them. So it's it's, a, a, it's, a, priming, to, a priming and a grooming. It is. It, yeah. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's, those are the words. So you have to fight back against that and you have to realize it in the first place. Right. So say, for example, a banker who goes into their job at 21, they think that becomes their world, right? Because they're being brainwashed and it's Stockholm syndrome in that particular industry. Now, they they might go into it with good intentions. They might think, yeah, you know what? I know this is a really hard life, but I'm going to work in it for like 10, 15 years, come out and then do my own thing. How often does that really happen? What really happens is that they get broken down, they get brainwashed, or they have a nervous breakdown. Yeah. How many of them come through the other side? Yeah. It fully intact. And how many of them along that way 
make the correct decisions that will propel the rest of their life in the way that they actually wanted it to be in order to find happiness. Okay. To answer your question, I would say more people in 2017 than in 1997. More people come out the other side because there is more information about get up and go. There is more information about DIY, do it yourself. There is more information about independence, entrepreneurship. A lot of it's trash, but some of it resonates. And so I think that actually we're ending up in a situation where people are going like, yeah, you know what? I really want to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to go on this Morgan Stanley graduate scheme and I will do it for eight years. And they do do it for eight years or less and quickly spin out into what they want to do. I think in our generation, you know, we were the last generation, you and I, of the long career syndrome, right? Be with a company for five to eight years, switch five to eight years, switch five to eight years. And because you, as you rightly pointed out, it's such an amazing point that we're from the analog generation that used to hand out flyers and also tweet. So you've got people that are in our generation that you do the five to eight year career move. And then also there are people in our generation that do the startup work for a different company every 15 months thing. So I think, I think that the thing that you're talking about does exist 100%. But I think it's deteriorating. I do think that if your concern is that how many people do it, the lesser amount, the lesser amount of people break out and do their own thing. Maybe from my lens and where I'm looking, I'm seeing that more and more people are doing it. I think the recession, the 2008 recession, was the greatest thing to happen to our generation culturally. It hurt some people on an individual micro level, but on a macro level, I think it raised awareness, consciousness of people that, you know, you're out here by yourself. And if you're waiting for that JP Morgan or Lehman Brothers paycheck to come through every 29, 31 days, in some fucking cases, it might not through no fault of your own. I spoke at Professional Asian, you know, Professional Asian, that group on Facebook. Mm. I spoke at one of their talks recently and people started laughing when I said this. I don't know if they fucking got it until I said it two or three times. I was like, the people who I fucking love the most are women that have just had kids. And they were laughing. They were like, oh, it was funny. I'm like, no, listen to me. Women that have just had kids that have to stay home and breastfeed, in most cases, that their bodies are kind of fucked up because they've just had a baby, so they can't exactly go out and do star jumps, right? They can't get straight back into the workforce, right? Oh, shit's hurting. There might be some fucking diabetes or calcium shit, zinc, iron, whatever. They're the motherfuckers I love the most because they're the ones that are like, you know what? I can whip up a mean cupcake or I can do an audit on someone's SEO or I can bookkeep for someone. And what do they do? Two and a half days a week, they hit the market and they do it. Two and a half days a week, maybe one of their in-laws or mother or somebody's helping out, right? And they could rest, they could sleep, they could catch up. They're like, you know what? I want to keep my brain active. That's why I love them. And that's what I think is happening is that when anybody has that reflection time, and I think more and more people are getting access to reflection time, they're being like, fuck this, man. Like, I should do this on the side. And on the side grows to in parallel to what you're doing, and in parallel grows to more meaningful than what you're doing, or even maybe more rewarding, and then people switch out. It's not the case with most people. It's not a 51, 49 thing. But I believe that it's more people now than it was in 1997, and that's a cause for celebration more than concern. Is that a long point? No, no, it's just interesting because you've got the difference between an optimist and a pessimist, right? Yeah. <laughs> so was this podcast about you've got the difference, how we're different? You've got the difference between parents who champion their child and the ones who, you know, tell them they're a failure, basically. Did your parents actually tell you you're a failure? Oh, yeah. Fuck yeah. You're kidding me. Jesus. See, the worst that my dad ever got, because my dad is the more vocal one. My mom just is like, happy, happy, joy, joy, love me regardless, go, go, go. I don't fucking get what you're doing. Like, I can literally tell my mom, I just did a sellout 500 person fucking talk with Gary Vaynerchuk and he's an investor in Facebook and Uber and she'd be like, that's nice. But how did you, did you guys eat though? <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, mom, we fucking ate. We got, we fucking ordered pizzas in and everyone was good. Who was with you? Was Vikash with you? Did he like, did he come from work? Was your, I'm like, fuck mom. So like, that's my mom. And my dad is like, my dad is like, I'd be like, oh, I went to this country and went to this networking event and I caught up with this person and he'd be like, did you get paid for it? And I'm like, nah, bro, I didn't get paid for it. It's not about getting paid for it. It's about being seen, shaking hands and making a commitment, you know, making an investment in that industry to let people know, like, I'm here for the long term. Mm. But recently he's kind of changed. He's seen the money that's coming in. He's like, okay, fuck it. I don't know how he's doing it, but it seems to be coming together. But I don't think they ever actually called me a failure, but my dad does put me under like mad, has put me under pressure in the past. 
But I think now that he sees it working and he sees the house and the shit, like he's like, all right, fuck it. Like I might not necessarily get it, but the boy's making it, he's still taping it together. Yeah. But if they told me it was a failure, I'd probably punch him in the fucking mouth. Yeah. But th- this is one of my points, right? Um, in a massively roundabout way is that there is, as you say, there's so much information. There's so much knowledge out there that we didn't have back in 1997. Mm. Yeah. Just fact. We had, Books then that were ropey at best. Yeah, now, now, if you want to learn anything, you can literally learn it for free. Yeah. On the toilet. Exactly. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, and who you were describing before about the, the women who've just had kids, that's my wife. You're literally, she's incredibly driven. She's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, you know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But I can't wait to get a woman pregnant just to see how she responds. <laughs> just, and she better do some fucking ill shit. Like, it better be some wicked business idea. Otherwise, I'm impregnated the wrong fucking woman Jessel was right yeah Jessel um, was right yeah but okay so if you're talking about where people are focusing their attention to yeah there is all this information there is all this knowledge but there is an information overload for sure yeah you can be swamped by this thing and end up thinking oh fuck it do you know what I'm just gonna watch Netflix mm. yeah you absolutely can be but the thing is there are always going to be more important things for you to focus on. Yeah. Like, for example, that there's this phrase being bandied around in the, in the podcasting world and the self-help world and all this kind of stuff about being world-class, 10xing things. Right? <laughs> yeah. So it's fucking life hacking, growth hacking. Life hacking, growth s- hacking. Human optimization. Yeah. Ty- like fucking bollocks. Yeah. Now, imagine just for one moment that all these podcasts that people are listening, I'm not rubbishing podcasts at all. All these, all these kind of podcasts and self-help books and courses that people are going on to improve themselves in terms of their, their, maybe their happiness or what they want to do in life and stuff, it's great. I think in general, it's absolutely great. Because the intent is good. Yeah, because you know, if you want to improve yourself and your situation, yeah. it's brilliant. Yeah. Imagine if people focus that much on becoming a better parent to their children. Imagine if they wanted to be a world-class parent or 10x their child. I don't know what that yeah, means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, but yeah. you know what I mean, It's right? a very good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So imagine imagine if they actually focused that much on being a great parent, yeah? A yeah. world-class parent. Yeah. Where, where they're looking at their child and really spending time with them and not just on their phone, yeah? Yeah. Where you're just fucking around on Instagram and your kid's just like, you know, about to eat the fucking plug socket or some yeah, shit yeah, like yeah. that, yeah? Yeah. Imagine if you focused on being an incredible family member where you're organized, you put up a calendar and everyone shares it. You say, yeah, look, we're going to meet here. We're going to do this. We're going to go on this trip, all this kind of stuff because family is really fucking important. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important. Right. Imagine if you kept like an Excel spreadsheet with your friends and you ticked off the last time you met them. Yeah. And you color coordinated it. Right. And you said, yeah, these are all my friends. These are kind of blah, 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 blah. I haven't seen this person for two years. I've made very little effort with this person. They have made an effort with me. Yeah. I'm going to rectify that and I'm going to enrich my life and theirs, hopefully. Yeah. Imagine if people put their all into things like family and friends and children and time in terms of the, the, the things that matter the most. This is what I'm trying to say. Like, I'm just saying this point appallingly because it's only just coming to me over the last sort of three months. Yeah. I mean, even this conversation is helping me work things out in my head. Imagine if people spent their time on the things that matter the most. Yeah. And not, not in a kind of like career-based thing. Don't get me wrong. Career is important. Work is important. It's, it's you know, it's the security that's the, the sort of, you know, the foundation for so many things. Yeah, I absolutely get that. But outside of that, I, I, just, I just look at a lot of people, and also because of the age that we're at right now, I don't know. There seems to be a callousness amongst guys where they're just kind of cutting off from each other a lot. Yeah. That I've seen. It's kind of like they'll stick to someone that they want to know and fuck anyone else basically. Mm. Right. And, and if they're ki- if, if they're not kind of investing in their kids, it doesn't really matter because they're the doing this or this, that there's a lot of justification in it that I'm noticing with people in the thirties. Mm. Whereas you can't justify everything. You can't always justify your bad choices. Sometimes you like, you know what? I made a bad choice. Yeah. I need to rectify it, not justify it. And I need, I need to look at my life and think, what are the most important things that if I'm on my, you know, it's, it's the old cliche, if you're on your deathbed, blah, 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 what are my regrets, all that kind of stuff. Okay, this isn't, I'm not going that far, but it, it's about kind of mapping and, and having an actual kind of active handle on where your life is going 
and the things you're spending your time on, you know? So that would come down to values, like value sets. Like, for example, you will value investing in your ability to be a 10x father, okay? That's something that you value. But you are blessed, nature, nurture, whatever, with a stronger mind so that everything else that's fucking with you, so girls with big tits on Instagram, the latest Aston Martin, they're not cracking you enough to prioritize themselves over your kids. But there are other people that were born with a weaker mind and actually when they should be staying at home with their kids, but they're going out to the latest Shorty Blitz at Jazz Cafe show when they're 42 years old, in our world, they should know better. In their world, they don't. So when you're saying imagine, so it's kind of like the John Lennon thing, right? It's like we have to imagine it because the reality is that's just not going to be the case with human beings. And the kind of enlightenment, the kind of um, raising of consciousness, I know we go back to the whole mindfulness thing, but the collective raising of consciousness takes generations. It doesn't take, it occurs with individuals. Like you're going to be a better dad than your dad was, whether you like it or not. Like you just got access to more information. Your son, God willing, will be a better father to your grandson than you were to him because of your knowledge that you passed to him plus knowledge from the day that he contextualizes himself. But I think that all these things will happen. I think as we as we have less and less problems in the future, and I think we'll eventually net out to less and less problems, that people will do that. People will be like, fuck, man, like we don't have as much of an environment problem. And I'm not talking about in the next 25 to 75 years. I'm talking about, you know, 200 to 350 years from now. We're going to have figured out a lot. So we're going to have life hacked our way to a fucking society that infrastructurally is utopian. And the only last thing that needs to click into place is the mind. Like we're going to live in a world in 350 years where you don't need to kill uh, cows to get the same level of protein, if not better. You might be able to get the same level of hormone free protein and walk around with a fucking six pack and huge arms and shit getting eating beef but beef that was ne- that never came from you know a, a dead animal so i think i think all the stuff you're talking about's coming i just think that maybe your your foresight is frustrated because you're 150 years ahead and you're maybe hoping for it in the next 25 to 50 years maybe or maybe things will get worse things don't always get better you know if you, if you looked at it if you looked at things 100 years ago and said okay in 100 years time you're going to have these fucking little computers yeah they'll be like what's a computer okay we'll need to catch you up on that you'll have this thing <laughs> where all the information in the world is available at your fingertips for free yeah yeah you'll have cars that can drive themselves you'll have this and that and blah 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 they'll be like wow that sounds great and then you'll be like okay except climate change is heating up the world and you're going to be kind of fucked and you might need to move planets in a couple of hundred years' time. They'll be like, well, okay, that's not so good, you know. So there's good and bad in everything. There's good and bad in every situation. But there are certain things which are really, really bad, which are coming. Yeah. And you're talking about in, in 300 years' time. In 300 years' time, will humans even be humans anymore? Are there going to be little chips in our brain? Will the robots just overthrow us anyway? God knows. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Yeah. We're not going to be around to see it. Yeah, we're not. All we can do is in our own lifetimes try to affect our own lives, those of our children, yeah, and try and influence people in a positive way. So let's talk about children. In, is, are there any ways glaringly obvious to you now that you've got two kids that you are actively parenting your boys in a way that's the active opposite of the way that you were parented? Yeah, I mean, this is going to go deep. Me and my brother basically had different parents, effectively. Yeah. We had the same biological parents. We lived in the same house. They were really, really not nice to my brother. You know, they were really harsh on him. And he was an intelligent little fucker and had boundless energy and they didn't know how to direct him. He's older, younger? He's older. ADHD or anything like that? Not, not ADHD, but um, like hyper intelligent, very highly strung. And he was in that generation where he got bullied as fuck, yeah, for being brown in a white school, like being the only brown in the whole place. Yeah. He was bullied excessively. My mum didn't know how to handle him, so they used to, you know, they used to hit him, yeah. all this kind of stuff. His confidence was broken, 
you know, in so many ways. Yet he was incredibly clever, ended up going to Oxford on a full scholarship, all this kind of stuff and Shit. blah, blah, blah. Um, but me, they never touched me, basically. I think there was odd clip around the year, you know, all this kind of stuff. But they were lovely to me. They were fucking great to me in general, you know, until like I was older and then the expectation, you know, and, and oh, you're a failure. Oh, we do this for you and that for you and you do you know, all that kind of stuff. That's typical Asian stuff. So if you talk about me and my brother, we had wildly different experiences. Um, I always try and look at that generation and think, okay, what can we learn from that? Because I look at my first son, he's a lot like my brother, a lot. You know, he's a lot like me, but he's also, he also could be basically the reincarnation of my brother at that age. That's the way I view it. I think, okay, how can I learn from my parents' mistakes with how they raised my brother? Yeah. I look at my other son. He, he, I think he's my father-in-law, basically. Right. Yeah. And he had, <laughs> a, he had a completely different set of issues. He was one of, like, fucking nine children in the middle, completely lost in the mix. You know, they barely recognise his existence. You know? <laughs> Ironically, he's ended up doing the best out of all those children. Yeah. Yeah. But he's still got, you know, plenty of kind of issues from his childhood and all that kind of stuff. So I look at my other son and I think, okay, we've got another kind of brown print for him. Yeah. What can I learn from all this? And, and I think this is one thing I'll say. I love my parents. You know, most people love their parents, right? But they fucking made mistakes. And you shouldn't have them as the sacred cow and think, okay, you know what? Do you know what? No one should talk shit about my parents. I'm never even going to contemplate this. They did this. You have to have this callous ability as a parent, yeah, to look at what your parents did, where they went right and where they went wrong, dispassionately, and then try and take the best elements of what they did and try not to repeat their mistakes. And that sounds so blindingly obvious. When, when you wrap up years of them parenting you, of them raising you, them knowing what buttons to push, yeah, and emotions and hormones and all these kind of things, most people can't manage it. <laughs> Bizarrely yeah. enough, yeah. They, they, they let all these things get to them, you know. I'm very lucky because my wife has a degree in psychology. that She, she did like a degree whilst working just for a laugh. This was her second degree. She's that kind of person. Sucker for punishment. Amazing. Yeah. But like both of us, we kind of had this unique skill set where we've both come together. And I guess like, I don't know, we both think, we both think about these things a lot and then act out on them, mm. on our children, you know? And, and there, there are obvious things I could say. I could say, oh, you know, limit their screen time with digital things or, you know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's just an obvious thing at this point, which, which hard to pull off though. I've seen a lot of parents talk a lot of shit when their kids born, like I'm not going to let him fuck with an iPad. Yeah. And as soon as they start screaming for three days, they're like, uh, power button, pin number, here's an iPad. Most, some kids are just parents, fucked. Most parents nowadays. Yeah. You know, people don't realize that there, there is no long-term research into this shit. You know, you think how addicted I am to fucking Twitter. Mm. Yeah. Give a kid a fucking iPhone. I mean, Jesus, it's yeah. game over. It, but but this is my point. I'm a con, I'm a contrarian by default. So are you in many ways. Yeah. But it's it's about looking at where society is heading. Looking at I'm not just talking about children. It's about looking at things and then thinking. Okay, yes, I like this. No, I don't like that. I can see everyone is going this way. Therefore, I will go that way instead. Yeah, because I think they're going down the wrong direction here, mm. you know. And at some point, it's okay to think these things, but then you also have to act on it. Like, I'll always remember that Vaynerworld thing when you were, you were talking to Gary about your dissertation. He was like, I don't care. Mm. And you were like, no, no, I'm going to push back on that. And he was like, look, did you actually do anything about this dissertation, this great dissertation mm. idea? Did you make any money off it? Did you push it? And it, you were like, no, but that's not the point. He was like, yeah, that is the point. Shut the fuck up. You know where I fucked up? Go on. I made a fucking fortune off it. Did you? I went to Canada and I started the first independent ringtones portal in Canada. Damn. But at the time, I was trying to get the point home that getting information in those days was not as easy. You used to go to the store and mm. buy magazines. And he was like, cool, anyone could have done that. I was like, yeah, anyone could have, but they didn't have the option of buying sneakers at the same time. I was sacrificing to go and get print information. And, um, but yeah, like I, I'm like, I mean... Dude, like my obsession, so Vikash gave me my first mobile in 97, like just to hold in my hand, 96, 97. It was the Motorola Graphite, the block with the edges at the back and the, the thin wire aerial that comes out. And I looked at it, I was like, this shit's cordless and I can make free phone calls. Not only can I make phone calls wirelessly, 
but they're free after seven. My mind <laughs> erupted and I was like, somehow or another, I need to find out more about this device. So I found out everything, GSM, 900 megahertz, 1800 megahertz, nickel metal hydride battery, lithium ion battery, fucking every damn thing. And that mapped itself into my choice of dissertation. And that mapped itself into me being way above average confidence wise and com competence wise at 23 to look at a CEO in the face and be like, you need to invest in this business and I will see, I'll be the day-to-day the -day MD for you. Bro, that was at 22. When I went to see that guy, although I'd left a job in the UK where I'd, you know, I had the fucking hot girlfriend and the brand new car out the showroom. I went to Canada. I was collecting glasses on a boat. And then someone said, we were like in our a place where they arrange jobs for these exchange students. And they were like, does anybody know anything about mobile phones? And I was like, I literally put my hand up. I was like, yeah. Rishi from Sync Bar, still one of my boys to this day. I was like, put your motherfucking hand up. So he put his hand up as well. We were like, we know phones. And then we started selling phones, became the top phone sales guys, him particularly. We got our trade off was I told them if we get the top sales in this company selling phones in student campuses, we want five minutes with the CEO. We got the top sales. Our area manager was like, good job, guys. You got the top sales. Here's a little fucking bonus. And I was like, yo, what we asked for was five minutes with the CEO. They were like, he's on his way to the airport. He's going to Dublin. I was like, he's on his way. He's not left. We went in. I was like, I need you to know that this is my boy, Rishi. He was your top salesperson in the company. And I'm Raj, and I know fucking everything about mobile phones, including ringtone. And he was like, yeah, cool. I'll give you both your own divisions. And off he went to the airport. <laughs> so it did map into something. Yeah. It did map into. And yeah, that startup that I worked on, it's called Student Tones. I did a TV tour off it and everything. It fucking flopped. But fuck, did I, did I then, because I did a TV tour off it, I came to the UK, started working on mobile downloads for movies and TV shows, pre-iPhone, Sony Ericsson, Nokia, you name it. Doubled down on my relationship with Dynamo, who nowadays is a tier A, whatever you want to say, you know, what did I say? Magician. A. No, he's a magician, but he's a something A. A-list. A-list celebrity, oh, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. And so it all fucking, it all mapped out perfectly. I just wish at the time, it... it Bro, the thing about that argument with Gary, and I appreciate you fact they're saying that I pushed back because mm -hmm. that took balls to push back at my mentor in yeah. front of 500 people that adore him, yeah. not me. I'm just some fucking packy on stage that's like pulled the whole thing off, right? But like they fuck with him and I was like, nah, bro, you don't understand. Like pulling that research off was hard and manual and graft. But it hit me months later when I watched the video several times and I was like, I get what he was saying. And actually... The reason why my talks right now, I get paid a fortune to talk now. I just, my agent just emailed me and said, this is your fee for, the, for a one hour talk I've got to give in Dubai, right? And I was like, the one thing that was always missing out of my talks, my interviews and all that shit was that gap in the middle. I was like, the kid who loved phones, did a dissertation about it, some shit, some shit, some shit in the middle. And now I'm Raj Katecha CCA. The thing in the middle was starting the ringtones portal, which I just fucking... Because it was a failure, I was just like, fuck it, don't talk about it. But it was that failure that was the thing, and I wish I'd remember at the time. But even if I didn't remember at the time, you know what made the whole thing worth it? Is the fact that I personally got that lesson. Everyone's like, I love Vaynerworld, I love Vaynerworld. I'm like, you didn't get as much out of it as I did. Mm -hmm. Because it was me, like, it's like me and you are talking right now. I don't see the 500 people in the room. If it's just me and you right now, and you're Gary, I don't give a fuck if there's 500 people here, or it's just me and you and Hatch End. Mm. The gems that that guy's dropping, he's dropping for me. Why? Because I architected the question. And why did I architect the question? I'm not a professional journalist. I architected the questions. I architected the questions. It's my own, it's my own selfish answers that I needed. I architected the questions. So I don't even know what my point was, but I'm so glad you mentioned that because I've never said that before. Like everyone thinks people literally have texted me on the internet like, ha ha, Gary handed your ass to you. You were trying to be smart. And I'm like, nah, bro. If you don't realize how much fucking how that's benefited me, that question and, and getting that slap off him and slapping back, the choice to slap back, you know? Well, the, there's two points that I want to make about and why I raised that point specifically. I was even thinking about it today. I did my dissertation, because yeah, I did business studies. 
I did my yeah, dis- me too, motherfucker. <laughs> 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 Jesus Christ. I bet we've got the same fucking fingerprint as well, like touch yeah. ID. Do you want yeah. to try to unlock my phone? <laughs> yeah. If that works, that would be fucking yeah. There's like a one in 50,000 chance, you know that. Well, fucking try it then. No, 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 try it, right. try it. Oh, shit. If you unlock it, let me just make sure there's no fucking dick pics on there. All right, cool. Go ahead. No, thank God. Oh, fucking thank God. Jesus. That would be a step too far. Okay, oh, so the reason I, wait, I I raised that Vayner World thing yeah. Yeah, is... Um, so basically, Gary pushed back on you and said, look, you did your dissertation, who gives a shit? You, did, did you actually put it into something amazing and good or, mm. or, or like a massive lesson learned? And I never said no, thank God. No. Yeah. I was thinking about my own dissertation because I did my dissertation in, what, 2003 or four or something, I don't know. And um, it was on the future of music. Yeah. Mm. And... And so basically, Dope. my entire dissertation was like, so this was in 2003, I think. And I was like, I think that in the next decade, yeah, music is going to move to this thing called streaming. Yeah, because I'd read a little bit about it. And then I thought, okay, let me just investigate this. Yeah, And then I came up with my own thoughts, a couple of bits here and there, whatever, whatever. And, um, and so basically, it was all about music streaming. And it turns out, I was pretty fucking accurate about almost everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. So, so you've got Gary on one shoulder saying, so the fuck what? Well done. You had some foresight, but what did you do? Yeah. I didn't go and get a job at Spotify or something like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And even as a DJ, I mean, it's made no actual real practical difference to me. As a consumer, I like it because I have a, I pay for Google Play Music and I listen to new music. So what? I'm giving Google the fucking money. It doesn't matter. Yeah. What, what did it matter other than it helped me get a 2-1? Right. On the other hand, yeah, you've got the whole kind of Gary Vaynerchuk thing, which is, again, part of that kind of, like, self-improvement, 10 x you know, this, that, whatever. I don't know if he's from that world. I don't know, no, no, he's I not. think he's more from a hyper-practical business-building revenue generating. He, he is, but he's still from the... This is the thing. He's from this... There's a very kind of American movement when it comes to work, right? So mm. this, this is my point. I, I made it poorly. So this, this kind of American view of what work is and how you should work and how it should be your life effectively. Yeah? You mm-hmm. should throw yourself into everything. Now, I don't know Gary Vaynerchuk like you do. Yeah. I don't know anything kind of about how he is behind closed doors, what his personal life is like or this or that. He might have it all fucking clocked. Absolutely. But in terms of the advice that him and his peers frequently give, although I think he's more focused too. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I think you're right. But people like him who are kind of like, look, you need to do this, that, and the other, right? And then that very kind of American mindset of like, you know, work from six in the morning till midnight mm-hmm. kind of thing, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's great. However, there are implications to it if you're trying to find happiness and have a balanced life, mm-hmm. right? So you have to take everything with a bit of a grain of salt, yeah? So I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying you need to kind of internalize it and think, okay, does this fit into the person that I want to be? Mm. Is this going to find? Is this going to help me find happiness? Right. So it's just. I think all these things you need to question everything right now. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if it's the age we're at, or, or or like that kind of information overload that's going on right now. But I find myself more and more thinking, okay, I need to stop and question this. It's the perfect segue into the point I wanted to make that I spoke to you about. I've been in the UK for maybe a week plus change. Okay. I was on a channel, you know, I, I subscribe to a bunch of content channels on Facebook. One of them is Channel 4. Channel 4, two, three days ago, I'll show you the video. They were up in Barnsley and they were talking about immigration. Now, you know, Barnsley fucking white people like some motherfuckers, right? So they're up there talking about like asking white people, what do you think about immigrants, immigration? And actually, I'm from the North and I grew up with white people. They're not all bad, but there are pockets of the North where white people are on some fucking dumb shit, right? <laughs> now, they they were asking these old white people specifically, what do you think about immigrants? And some of them made some points, which they were like, you know, I don't mind if you've been here for a couple of generations and your kids are here and they speak English, you're welcome to stay. If you're coming here and sending money back home, I'd rather you didn't, and I'd rather you, you know, that I'd rather that's, I don't, I'm not okay with that. So then this journalist asked a bunch of people and then they were all asked, answering the same thing. No one was saying something overtly racist. They were just saying old white people shit, right? That if you're a Paki or a brown guy like us, you just, you get it. You're like, all right, fuck it, whatever. Like, it's all good. Yeah. Like, I've been around those motherfuckers before, 80s. You know how it goes, right? But then they were like, 
Then the journalist goes, so what do you think, what, what do you want then? Do you want them to all go back to their own country or? And I was like, motherfucker, you just fed him that line. None of these white people, as dumb as they are, as fucking semi or fully bigoted as they are, none of them said on camera they should go back to their own country. And they fed him that line. Then I'm about to download the audio tonight. I was driving around in the car on Friday and I'm listening on the afternoon show. And on the afternoon show on Radio 1, you, you can call in and you can request a song and you can say what that song means to you. Some white woman called in and she was like, my song is rudimental because me and my husband eloped in Vegas and we drove through Death Valley, which is a hundred miles of no birds, no human beings, no nothing, just death. And rudimental came on and, you know, we just drove through the desert and it was amazing. The beginning of that, when she brought her on the show, she was like, oh, it's whatever white woman on the show. Uh, you know, how's, it, how's that Friday feeling? How's it feel? Ready for the weekend? Ready to put the week behind you? Oh, fucking Friday. Can't wait, right? Fucking up. And I was like, you're telling potentially millions of listeners that Friday's good, the week is shit, and the weekend is awesome. And Gary's done that video about if you complain about the week, there's something wrong in your life. If you complain about... Mondays, like if you only had a week to live, it doesn't matter whether it's Monday, Tuesday, Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday, whatever, you'd be great. Time is time is time. And the only reason why you're upset about Monday is because you made a life choice that doesn't map to your passion or what it is that you're keen about. And so therefore you feel like you're kind of obliged to do something you don't want to do. So I'm looking at all that and I'm like, and I'm literally going to grab that audio and I'm going to grab the channel four footage. And one of my next upcoming Facebook videos is going to be like, guys, I don't fucking like some of the shit that's on social media. Like I'm becoming aware to the fact that although channel four isn't an overtly racist platform, they were feeding their people lines for clicks the same way that a Buzzfeed would. And the same way that radio one isn't overtly anti-capitalist pro the system, you know, build worker bodies. There's feeding lines out to make people feel like Monday to Friday's work. Saturday, Sunday is great, celebrate it, which is also causing binge drinking and things of that nature. And all of these platforms that we know, like, trust, they're part, you know, you talked about earlier on, there was only four channels when we were a kid. Well, BBC was one of those brands and Channel 4 certainly was, right? And they're pumping dumb shit into the media that everyone's consuming like this. Yeah. So when someone like me and you comes along, especially me, because at least you've got the balance in your personality, I fucking jump on couches and scream at motherfuckers. Like they think of us like we're psychos, like we're mad. They look at people like Kanye and go, he's mad. But it's like, nah, like you're not, re you're not realizing that by listening to this shit, by liking it, by sharing it, even by passively listening to it and subconsciously agreeing to it, you're fucking your whole life up because you're going to die. And you're going to die thinking the weekends were better than the weekdays. You're going to die thinking that white people hate you when they don't. Most white people, you and I know, some are fucked, but most white people are cool as fuck. Yeah. Like 99.99999%, like what they talk about Muslims, 99.99999999% are just cool as fuck. And you can talk to them about fucking Jay-Z and have a kebab and just chill out and it's all good. But they're trying to tell us like they're not. And that's some fucked up shit, man. Yeah. It's mind control. Yeah. And I think the, one of the best things I've done this calendar year is I went on a Twitter fast. Yeah, in fact, it wasn't just Twitter. It was completely social media. Dope. So I got rid of Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. I'm not on anything else. So I literally uninstalled them from my phone, took the bookmarks off my browser on, on, on uh, my computer, everything. It, it was such an illuminating week. Incredible. And like the, there are times when I miss Twitter. Why, why a week? I just, want to, let's, I just want to make sure I understand the methodology before you go into the... To be honest, I thought a week was all I could really handle as far as Twitter came. Like fair, fair. Face, Facebook, I mean, I'm actually a shareholder in Facebook, but um, I've kind of gradually... Uh, I'm using Facebook less and less mm. in terms of... I, and I'm noticing people are posting less and less. I think people are coming very conscious. Mm. And Facebook are really snooping a lot. If you know behind the scenes what they're doing. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, it's pretty shocking. So I've even literally uninstalled it from my phone now. Um, so I'll look on it on the web browser and that's it. And um, Instagram, I don't, I don't really use that much, to be honest. It's like, Instagram is for like, it's like Twitter for people who can't read. 
And then Snapchat, mm-hmm. Snapchat I, I don't even use Snapchat anymore, to be honest, since Instagram took all the best features. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, it was really mostly a Twitter fast. And I started seeing all these kind of patterns and stuff. It was the, one of the best things that I've done this year. And since then, I have dramatically cut down on my Twitter usage and the amount that I tweet as well. And then I did another thing after that. There is there's this basically this, this um, kind of web app you can use where you can mass delete your tweets. So I had previously uh, tweeted probably about, and, and there's also one for Facebook as well. I previously tweeted about, I don't know, maybe 60, 70,000 times. Yeah. Yeah. Pe- shit. Penny for your thoughts, right? Penny for your tweets. And so I went through it over the course of about a month. I was spending, like, in the evenings, I'd spend about an hour doing this because I thought this was good. So I was reading over old tweets, and then you can check it because you can't actually do that on Twitter's own, on, on, on their own profile. True. So you could do this in like a, a much, much quicker way, probably about like at least 20 times more quickly. And uh, I paid $10 for it, fine, whatever. And um, I was, so I was going through old tweets and you're watching the evolution of Twitter. Yeah. Back at the beginning when we were actually talking to each other, there was just text. There were no images, no videos, no nothing, no GIFs, anything like that. It was just text. And people actually used to talk to each other and tweet out what song they were listening to. Those are the main things, right? True. And then it moved into once you started getting photos, then videos, then GIFs. And then you go into the whole kind of like, the, the way that, I'll, okay, I won't go on about this, but basically it used to be social media with 80% social and 20% media. Yeah. Now, good point. it's 80% media, 20% social. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's what the whole thing made me realize. That's a good point. Yeah. But Jewel. That, that, that kind of week off Twitter and going through all my old tweets, like fucking 70,000 of them or whatever it was, I've now reduced it to fewer tweets than the amount of followers I have. So I've got like, I've got about 1,400 followers, which is nothing in like, you know, whatever. Mm. But, and so I, I now have displayed about 1,300 and something tweets. Wow. Yeah, and now every week, I'll spend 10 minutes going through what I've tweeted over, over, the, over the past week and I'll delete the ones that I think are no longer relevant. Wow. And that has made a massive difference to my whole outlook, not just on Twitter, but social media, about self-control, about who's trying to manipulating, uh, manipulate me into thinking what. Like, for example, on Friday now, there's a hashtag every Friday called Fry Yay, which is exactly yeah. what you're just saying. Facts. Great. It's Friday. Yay. It's yeah. Friday. Yeah. yeah. The week was so shit. Great. All your dreams will come true on the weekend. Just go and spend your way into oblivion or drink yeah, your yeah. way into oblivion yeah. or whatever. Yeah. 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 So all these things, question everything. Right now, we're at a really, really important phase. Yeah, you've got to question everything because people are really trying to manipulate you. Mm. One admission for my part, I mean, I'm got, so I just, I feel like I'm addicted to social media. I was noticing that before I get out of bed, I would spend literally 20 minutes to two hours on my phone, lying in bed, not having drank that first half liter of water that you're meant to, not having stretched, not having done a run, nothing. Just, I mean, of course, within that social media, there is some stuff I have to do. I get a bunch of DMs from a lot of people. I'll fire some back. I get some emails. I'll fire some back. No worries. Cool. But like, it's, um, I just, I found myself being like, yo, I'm spending too long on this because let's be hyper conservative. If I spend one hour a day, that's 365 hours a year. That's two weeks a year, I think, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe plus change, I don't know, whatever. So I was thinking like, all right, two weeks a year. If I'm on the planet for the next 50 years, and that's 50 times two, that's about two, two and a half years that I'm going to waste on social media or its incarnation between now and death. And if someone said to me, hey, try this cigarette, I'd be like, all right, cool, that cigarette looks cool, I'll try it. Oh, by the way, it's got nicotine in it and uh, tar, and it might reduce your life by two and a half years. I'd be like, well, fucking two and a half years' time, I might have kids, grandkids, whatever the fuck it is. If I can live till 77 instead of 75, I'll take it. Well, that's what the fuck I'm doing. That's the economics of social media. Yeah. Like, you're going to invest if you spend an hour a day, and not only me, I know I spend more than an hour a day, but even if it's conservative, I spend an hour a day as a professional in the industry, but consumers are spending an hour a day and that's costing them two and a half years. If they're, if you're middle aged and you spend an hour a day on social media, that's two and a half years, not 
skimmed off your life, but just that you'll ask for back. Mm. If you die at 77, you'll be like, wait, between middle age and now, two and a half years, I was facing downwards. Bro, and the way that I realized is that I'd be on the phone, you know, 20 minutes would go by in a yawn, in a heartbeat, but more realistically for me, north of an hour. And what would happen is some real shit would happen. I've got to go for a meeting, go for a coffee, whatever. I put the phone down. You know how I realized as I stood up, my body was like this. <laughs> like So for those of you who are listening, my body was that my shoulders were facing inwards to the front of my body. Like an embryo. My neck was shaped, yeah, shaped down. Imagine, right, yeah, like an embryo. Good, good example. So as I would sit back and actually push my shoulders to my back and stick my chest out, that shit would feel stiff and, you know, just awful, really, like dead, dead weight. And I was like, God damn, if my, if my body, like my shoulders, like things that have got nothing to do with social media, shoulders, chest, arms, they're not your brain, they're not receiving stimulus. But if they're locking into a certain place for such a period of time that actually your muscles relax into those positions and it hurts you to break out of them, then maybe I'm addicted to social media. So punchline, I see, and I know, I see Russell Brand, who's been pumping his social recently a lot, talking about, you know, you, you can get addicted to sex, heroin, crack, weed, whatever, alcohol, um, television. He also said, you know, you can get addicted to social media. I was like, well, look, I've just recently come across this epiphany. I too also, like you, <laughs> erased my social networks from my phone. And I also, like you, did it for a week because <laughs> I also, like you, thought that a week would be enough, right? And I, and, I, and I also, like you, have the same commentary about that week. It was fantastic. Um, and I was thinking to myself, shit, maybe I'm addicted to this social media stuff. So I listened to Russell Brand's book. I highly, highly, I'd love to know your opinion on Russell Brand, but I highly recommend the book because Russell Brand adds his technicolor interpretation in that book of the 12 step program. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you get addicted to alcohol or drugs or whatever, they take you through a 12 step process. Well, he basically interprets the 12 step process and openly in the book says, look, life is fucked. Life is hedged against you. No matter what you do, you're going to have some stuff that's fucked, about, fucked up about you. Society is going to find it, pour petrol on it. And your job is to try and fucking reel it back and make sure that it doesn't ruin your life or have a detrimental effect on your relationships, your health, your ability to think, et cetera, et cetera. I think Recovery is a fantastic book. Um, I'm coming to the very, very arse end of it now. I was listening to it before you walked into the flat and I'm fully compelled to get to the end of it, zip right back to season one on audiobook, on Audible and run the whole thing again. Wow. And keep listening to it because, because the good thing about my man, like Russell, is that he talks about his addiction with heroin and crack. He talks about working for MTV having unlimited car service, a salary, fucking the baddest chicks, working in Camden and walking down to the Camden Lock, the river, whatever, I'm not from London, but like that river that runs through Camden and just scoring heroin whilst working at MTV. Everybody being on his dick and no one telling him otherwise. So I'm like thinking to myself, well, if that's, if that's okay, then you know, if he's talking about that shit, then actually my trivial stuff is, you know, not so bad. Because you know what used to go down in this flat? Like, this flat was the Venus flytrap for Brown Girls and Harrow. Yeah. And a lot of that was, you know, was a lot of the stuff that he was talking about because he's done what I did, but times a trillion mm. in terms of, like, his sex addiction or whatever the fuck you want to call it. So a lot of it I found really, really useful. A lot of it, like, he's now got a girlfriend and a baby and he's thinking about getting married. I can honestly see when he talked about his wild boy days, I can see that mine is the SMA like distilled version of what he was talking about. Like I didn't, I didn't hit the numbers that he hit, but in terms of individual engagements with girls, a lot of the parallels that he's talking about were all there. And um, I just think it's a fucking f fantastic book. And I agree with you that you should, that you should question everything. But I think that questioning everything do, but fucking act on that shit. Yeah. Whether it's Russell Brand's book, whether it's fucking, yoga and meditation through some bullshit ass program like Deepak Chopra or Tony Robbins or actually working with somebody like on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But I think recognize in the 12 step program, like recognizing that there's a problem is one of the earlier stages, but quickly that forms into action. Like I really think you need to do something about it. And actually this is a credit to you 
like our friendship, which we will talk about now, that's one of the things whereby you're one of the few confidence that I can talk to. We had this fucking ridiculous conversation when you just walked in, right? When you were like, how long have you been seeing your girl for? And I gave you the, <laughs> I gave you the press release answer, right? Which is I've been seeing her for a year and a half. Yeah. But you were like, nah, but I fucking known about this shit for years. <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, you have known about it for years because you're Jessel. Whereas everybody else in the world doesn't know that I was hanging out with her and going for dinners with her and all that kind of shit for quite some time before we, you know, became a couple. Yeah. So like, it's, um, I think you, I think you, I think what you were talking about before when you were talking about certain people haven't had the self-awareness and the enlightenment, if everybody could do one thing right now, two things, one would be to, to really honestly say, is anything fucking me up right now? And what is it? It could be social media, it could be you pretending to be a white guy, it could be, you know, like the, being more Indian, more white, whatever, like, or it could be drug addiction, sex addiction, capitalism addiction, fucking you're just a bad kid to your parents. Find out what that is and then do something about it. And it's kind of like, that's point two. And point two A is look at who the fuck you fuck with. Because if I didn't fuck with you during the time where there was, you remember there was that girl that went psycho about the cancer and all that? Oh yeah. We ain't gonna talk about that. But like, no. but like there was, if there wasn't, if you went around at that point, I'd have no way had the fucking clarity to crawl out of that hole. And that was the only time that me, Raj Katech, your fucking king, Dada, would have, has ever been knocked for six. So you need to look at basically what's fucking me up and can I at least change the people around me right now to, to either stop them from being the people that are fucking me up or align them to be the people that will get me out of being fucked up. Yeah. Fair? Yeah, I think so. And uh, there's a lot to unpack from that. And I kind of go point by point. Uh, there's only a couple of points, really. Recently, I started doing something where um, I'm actually tracking how much television I'm watching. Because traditionally, I don't think you watch a lot of TV. No. No, which is great. It's like, it's like how I wish I didn't like chocolate kind of thing. Right? True. So um, I started tracking exactly how much TV I'm watching. Every time I watch a TV program, I make a note of it in Google Calendar. And I can actually review it. So my ambition is to no, not watch more than an hour of TV per night. Yeah. That's a lot. Oh, yeah. For me, that's a lot. For you, that's yeah. fucking low. That's a lot. Yeah. Oh, that's, like a, that's like TV as a job. But for the normal population, mm. that's like most people would switch the TV on. And, and, and I'm going to talk about another point. Basic, so they'd, they'd put TV on pretty much as soon as they get home. And they'd leave it on until pretty much they went to sleep. Fuck that life. Yeah. Now, no, that used to be me. That used to be me and my wife, mm. right? And this is only until last year I started saying, look, let's try this thing. Yeah, I didn't, it wasn't like some program that, from a self-help guru. I was just like, I think we're watching too much fucking TV right now, yeah? Mm. You know, it's too easy. We're, we're not making the most of the evenings. Mm. And so, um, so I was kind of like, look, let's try and stick to an hour a night. Yeah. And just knowing that made a difference. And now I started tracking it. Yeah. Mm. And it's made a big difference. So that's something that's really positive. Because like you were saying, acknowledge whatever is fucking you up right now, right? Uh, I think I was watching too much TV. Like, the, And the other thing is, is that but on the flip side of that, we never leave the TV on in the daytime because our children are there. Yeah. So the TV literally isn't on. My children probably watch about 10 minutes of TV or, or have done until recently uh, a week. Yeah. And that's when we're cutting their fingernails. So that's the only thing that would stop them fucking wriggling around. Yeah. <laughs> so otherwise, they literally don't watch TV. Yeah. Until probably the last kind of few months where we're relaxing a little bit. Yeah. Probably up to about maybe about half an hour a week or something. Compared to almost every single other child of parents that we know and et cetera, et cetera. That is an outlier situation mm -hmm. for sure. Except maybe one. I think actually one of our friends they don't even have a TV in the house, which I think is actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I agree with you. I mean, I know I know so, I know a lot of parents to this day where I don't think I've been in their house and the TV's not been on. Yeah, yeah, and the kids watching it. Yeah. Mm. Now, now you could take that and and apply it to whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it could be social media, it could be this, it could be that, whatever. whatever. Mm -hmm. We've all got our addictions. You know, I read an interview with the guy. You know, on um, when you swipe down to release and it refreshes Twitter. The Guardian posted a post about the people that feel guilt for programming that for. That's exactly for conceptualizing. the one. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. exactly the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I read that. It was a really long article. I read it over lunch, ironically, mm. um, through social media, obviously. 
and um and it was fascinating so the guy this was the guy who created that swipe down to reverse mm-hmm. it's deliberately like a casino like a slot machine in a casino mm-hmm. yeah the guy who created the facebook like button now uh doesn't use facebook at all mm. yeah and just outsources it to a social media manager mm. all this kind of stuff so the, the people who are literally creating all these technologies that have got us hooked are shunning them massively they're sending their children to schools where there are no digital anything, no iPads, anything like mm, that, mm. you know. All these kind of things. Do you think we're going through a correction then? Yeah, but this is the point. There, there has to be a correction at some point, but it's it's still going to be a massive minority mm. who are actually listening to this correction, you know. And, and until it's too late, people won't realise. And people get really testy about this. Never fucking say a thing to any parent that is even slightly in the grey area of criticism about how they're raising a child. Because they do not fucking react well. No one said, don't even post it. Don't even post anything on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I I posted on Facebook about how, um, you know, we don't let our kids watch TV. And here was an article explaining why it's really dangerous to let kids use iPads. Yeah, there is evidence mounting now because iPads have only been around since, what, 2010, Mm -hmm. right? So, and Steve Jobs didn't let his own fucking children use iPads. Yeah. Guy who created it. And all this this evidence is mounting. It, It was the post that, pissed off the most amount of people and they were all parents. It was incredible. I got so much hate for that post. It was hilarious. How? How did they hate? People were like, well, you know, that's just not the case. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, you know, this is really judgmental. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Everyone was justifying it. Mm. Right? Because when you... And the thing is, when you know you're doing something wrong, you act out even more. And you try and justify it. Yeah. But if you don't know you're doing anything wrong, that's even more dangerous. And not just for you, for your kids. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know that I, I don't want to go down that lane too much. I mean, I, I, if we kind of stay in the general realm of, of addictions and stuff, I'm, a, I'm addicted to social media. Like, I, the, I, I listening to this am. book, yeah, listening to this book made me. I mean, I'm addicted to a bunch of stuff, yeah, but stuff that I can correct as a result of other things, right? But the social media thing is like way too. You saw, I don't know if you saw my post on Facebook two days ago or a day ago where I was like, the time Diwali yeah. lesson. So my Facebook post, for those of you who haven't seen it, is Diwali lesson, colon. The time that you are spending, the time that you are maybe wasting, no, the time that you are spending or wasting on on your phone, on social media, when you're in the presence of your loved ones, is the time that you'll pray for once they're gone. Yeah. That was my first epiphany from listening to the recovery book, is that when I was on my phone, I was like, fuck, yeah, now... I do believe that there's still a time to go to your phone. Like everybody in my family, aside from me and my sister. So the other six members of my family are addicted to these fucking retarded um, TV shows. You know, the Indian one, Star Plus, oh, gee, where it's like, you know, the, the woman's skin is over white. Yeah. And then they got the flash and the, and the zoom in and the slow. Yeah. Yeah. That, see, now in my headphones, that sound effect is as accurate <laughs> sonically as one can be. Right. So that shit. So I think when everybody's fucking with that, it's okay for me to go upstairs, flick on Netflix and watch some shit or, or, you know, some social content. But again, on the flip side, where I realized I was fucking up was like waking up in 90 minutes on flicking through Instagram. And I talked to Kish about this yesterday. Uh, Shout out to Broken Soul Boy on Twitter. And I was saying to him that when we surf Instagram, like I, I got to Instagram late. I've been on it forever, but I started really consuming on it late. When you scroll down, you don't know what's coming next. You're literally scrolling down, hoping that the next piece of content matches you. We give Facebook and Instagram so much credit. Like, oh man, the algorithms give us the content we want to see. No, motherfucker, we scroll for that shit. If they give us what, if they gave us what we wanted to see, we would log into Facebook and it would look like Pinterest. There'd be 24 panels. And every panel would be algorithmically curated and accurate. But it's not, is it? We literally scroll down hoping, hope the next few pixels are relevant, hope the fucking next piece of content's relevant. And if it is, what do we do? Double down and reinforce the algorithm by liking it. And by the way, listeners, not even liking it. If you think that a like is the only way that you tell Facebook that you like content, you're a fucking fool. Because even stopping on a piece of content, when you literally... Click on that picture of that girl's bikini in a, in a bikini and then zoom in on her breasts. Facebook knows that shit. If they can tell faces on pictures and suggest whose faces they are, 
They certainly know where the cleavage is. They certainly know what pixels you're, you're on. They also know what speed you're scrolling at and what images you stop on. So you don't even need to tell Facebook what you like in inverted commas. When you stop on certain content and that engages you, they know you're fucking with that shit. And that's affecting the algorithm. algorithm. So John Lennon was a vociferous consumer of media in multiple forms, whether it was TV or newspapers or radio, whatever, whatever he could get his hands on. But the thing is, he used it in order to create. So I, I always say there's this difference between consumption and creation, right? And that, that's not something that's particularly new or anything, but it's really important. You know, how much are you consuming versus how much are you creating? Now, not everyone wants to create. Some people have really stressful jobs and they put their all into it. It gives them enough financial, uh, financial like compensation and stuff. Yeah. They just want to come home, switch the TV on for four hours, relax, and that's fine. Yeah. But if you're the kind of person and it's part of your nature that you want to create, right, which many of us are, then enable that. So, okay, getting back to John Lennon. He would actually use that and then create art directly from it. Yeah. And if you look at his solo material, it's very heavily influenced. Yeah. Now, it's fine to consume social media. It's fine to consume media. Yeah. If it's not consuming you. And that's the difference. So if you're consuming something willingly, like say, for example, I've recently started doing this whole thing where I'm watching an hour of TV, but I'm being really selective about what I'm watching. Yeah. I'm making sure that. You know, I go to Rotten Tomatoes or I read reviews or this or that. I make sure it's worth my time. What is my time worth? You know, same with books. I started this thing about three years ago, three and a half years ago. I was like, I was not reading enough. Not at all. Yeah. I justify it saying, oh, I read loads of articles through the fucking internet. No, bullshit. Read books. Read great books. Yeah. So now I read at least 25 books a year. But I make sure they're really good. I'm really fastidious about choosing the correct books and making sure they're really good and they're worth my time. And I, I've got a very high success rate now. I, I love almost all the books that I actually pick, you know. Fiction, non-fiction? Everything. Right. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that, okay, you're spending time on social media, yeah. If it's getting you money, fine. But that's a murky area in itself. Maybe you're just reading something and spotting trends. Maybe you're looking at the language of things. Yeah. Maybe you're seeing what people are consuming themselves and what they're attracted to. And thus, that's what you would kind of attenuate what you're creating. Yeah. So you're in tune with what the market is or the future market is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not a justification for just dossing on Instagram for one and a half hours. Yeah. yeah. Right. But, you know, you're a very visual person. You're also a very ideas based person. So as long as it's not out of control, yeah, then I'm not going to say what's the harm in it because there's a harm in everything. But, you know, don't downplay your influences, basically. But also be careful about what your influences are. I think the point is, if you look at when you talk about what, what do you contribute versus what do you consume or what do you create versus what do you consume, I think, again, for maybe the second or third time, the last time this happened, I erased Facebook from my phone, is that the ratios spun out against me yeah like i'm actively noticing that my body is too often hunched in a consume via mobile position and i'm actively noticing that you know sometimes you just need to go to the toilet and you're like hey an hour and a half ago i was when i pulled my phone out sometimes bro the most obvious one this will fucking click like immediately for you sometimes your fucking phone dies sometimes your phone literally dies in your hand because you fucking drilled it to death. And if it dies and you're like, fuck, I'd send that email. That's a big, important work thing. then you were basically bullshitting. Yeah. Like if your phone dies in your hand and you're like, oh my God, there is some fucking financial or emotional or some compensation attached to sending this email. But if it didn't, if that wasn't what was happening when the phone died, then you were just fucking about on Instagram, Snapchat, whatever. So I think from my point of view, like one of the things that I've taken away from Russell's book uh, is that, you know, he, he asks you to say, do I have a problem? I'm like, yes, I have a problem. Okay. How is that affecting people? Well, probably way too many times where I've been on the phone around loved ones. 
So that's precious. Let's say, for example, I die. I'm going to die tomorrow. And I'm like, man, I wish I could get more time with my sister, my girlfriend, my parents, whatever. I had that time. Mm. I was fucking flicking through some bullshit. Like, yes, social media makes me money, a lot of money. But not relative to the amount of time I spend on it. Of all the time I spend on social media, the trend spotting, the content creation, let's say it's 50% of my time, which is being generous because it's not, it's probably closer to 20. But let's say 50% of the time that I'm on an app is time where I'm actually doing something meaningful that will then map to me being compensated financially. Even if it's 50%, that means I'm still not fucking efficient to the degree of like two times. Should I give you one piece of advice? Get a smartwatch. I have found okay, okay. since, so I used to have a Fitbit Blaze that did kind of notifications. That was really simple. Yeah. But basically since what? So it's always, almost been a year. I've had a Samsung Gear S3 Classic. Yeah, which is this lovely looking watch right here. It's a good looking watch. It's really good looking. It's much better looking than an Apple Watch, I have to say. Yeah. But Apple Watch is great as well. Now, the thing that I've noticed so much in that past year, and my wife has noticed as well, massively, so much so that she wants one as well, <laughs> is that I really don't fuck around with my phone that much now. Yeah, I'm happy just to leave it there. It connects to my smartwatch. And the amount of apps I have on here, I've got like five fucking things, basically. Yeah. WhatsApp, email, I don't know, a, few, a couple of other things, like whatever. Nothing huge, basically. Everything else I've deactivated. It doesn't tell me. And then there's the health implications. So if I'm sitting there for an hour, it says, um, yeah, you're looking kind of fucking lazy right now. Yeah. You've been inactive for an hour. How about you stretch or sort your fucking life out? Shit. Right. And it has goals for you and all this kind of stuff. And in fact, the Apple Watch, the health and fitness aspect, I'd argue, is kind of better in certain ways yeah. because they stole a lot from Nike. Yeah. Now, those two things alone, yeah, would, if you, if you actually used it properly, the smartwatch, yeah, you would not look at your phone as much, not by half. Not, I don't know about half, but it would, it would dramatically reduce it. Plus, there's the health and fitness aspect. Mm. I, I honestly, like you and I have been talking about wearables for four fucking years now, basically. Mm -hmm. We were so far ahead of the curve. I was, I literally, the day that the Nike fuel band got released in this country, I was there at the Nike store buying one, mm -hmm. right? That's how far ahead we were. Yeah. Now, okay, we've not made money off it. Fine. As Gary Vaynerchuk would say, yeah, fine, yeah, yeah. fair enough, Gary. But, um, but in terms of how a smartwatch has impacted my life, it's got me separated from my phone in a lot of really useful ways. Mm -hmm. you know even and the main thing is for me is that i really wanted to make sure that me and my wife are not around our phone on our phones constantly around the children mm -hmm. yeah and, and there's times where we Whilst both like swallowing a leg or some shit <laughs> yeah, like... literally yeah literally. right um but and like both of us i mean I, I flop myself on that sometimes and justify it in some stupid way but i'm generally all right yeah thanks to the smartwatch in particular mm. yeah my wife i have to say there's times when like I'm like, baby, you need to get a fucking phone right now. You're pissing me off. This can't, like, look at our children. They're literally right there, and you're just on fucking Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If she's doing something productive or this or that, fine. Absolutely. Okay. You know, it's still not ideal, but whatever. Mm -hmm. And she gets pissed off at me because she knows I'm right. Mm -hmm. And that's why she starts saying, do you know what? Maybe I do need a smartwatch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It's something that you could give it a try. You know, if you think, because... You, who, I mean, who's going to fucking scroll on Instagram on an Apple Watch? For God's sake? You'd have to be a fucking addict. That would be a red flag right there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. So if you just if you just had certain notifications, important things that went to your watch, and you just left your fucking phone over there, just psychologically, it's just just two meters away, just yeah. out of reach, right? Then that's an important thing. Is that going to free you up for time and also tell you when you're being lazy as well? I wonder if the alarm clock the alarm clock is going to be the ultimate revival. Dude, okay. kids are the ultimate alarm clock. No, as in not for the purpose of getting you up, as in from the point of view of like, I keep an alarm clock by my bed, my phones are charged in the next room. So, That's because, to see, the problem is with iPhones and, and, and any smartphone for that matter, if you rely on the alarm application within that device, then once you switch the alarm off, more times than not, 
the remaining other notifications will be there ready to greet you. So for me, every morning when I wake up, there's a couple of dozen WhatsApps because obviously I have a lot of relationships in Dubai, yeah. work relationships or otherwise, where they've had a three hour head start on me. If I wake up at 9 a.m., they've been, you know, WhatsApping for three to five hours. So you come out of the alarm functional thing, which is, hey, this is an alarm. It's here to wake me up to immediately like, fuck, shit, did I miss this? Oh, this person liked your post or this person DM'd you or like, fuck me. It's a dopamine hit, man. Dude, so one thing that Russell talks about in the book is that to recognize when your need is there. So to get your brain to intervene. So that happened this morning. When I woke up this morning, I wake up naturally 99 days out of 100. I woke up naturally this morning. And by chance, as I was waking up, I heard the sound, doot, doot, like WhatsApp or whatever. And dude, my whole head, I'd barely woken up. My whole head from the tip of my cranium, down right down my spine, just went, Sh-sh-sh-sh. it was like, that was a real chemical passing through my body. Fuck. I felt it because, you know, you feel it because your body's raw. Yeah. When you wake up in the morning, your body's a canvas. There's no water. There's no, there's no, there's no stimulus in your body. What you've literally just woken up. And for the most part, your conscious is awake, but your body is still, that's why you can't do a backflip in the morning. Cause you're like, fuck, my body's still it's not even warmed up. Like the, the amino acids or whatever the fuck's meant to blow through your body just hasn't done it yet. And I felt this thing rip down my back when that thing went off. And my instinct was, you'll grab it. And I caught myself the way Russell Brand says. He's like, when you feel the addiction kick in, that's when you've got to stop yourself and be like, all right, you need to find strength from somewhere to resist. Mm-hmm. And I did. Mm-hmm. Motherfucker's smart. Like, but like, it's, it is real. It and, is real. And dopamine is real. And the whole fucking addiction is real. And... Some of the big macro points from this podcast, you know, being aware, like understanding that some shit is happening, preparing yourself, like auditing, cleaning, cleansing your social circle, your habits. I think they're probably the most significant paradigms of like Western human existence heading into the next kind of like five to 15 years. Because if you don't get this shit right now, you're going to form habits that are Instead of one decade in, I mean, for us, it would be five years, right? Because social media wasn't as potent, a, a, a platform, wasn't as potent a paradigm shift in culture pre-2012, 2010. But what's going to happen is it's going to be 2022, 2027. And this habit's going to be 15 years deep in you. And then it's going to be hard to break. We're lucky, we're fortunate in 2017 to be like, to be having these discussions like, yo, how's it affecting you? How's it affecting me? Like, what can we do about it? If we don't have these discussions and, and if we don't, you know, in our case, we're lucky we have big audiences. We can publish this content and ask other people who may not have organically asked themselves this question yet to ask themselves this question so that they can do something about it. It's like reality TV, you know, so much, like, like so much. reality TV. When we were growing up, it didn't exist. Mm. Yeah. We were literally there like for the birth of it. It's probably around what, maybe 2000. No, way before that. It was, uh, you remember that MTV show where people used to live in a different apartment together? MTV Cribs? No, prior, prior, prior. Oh, um, Real How, Real yeah, World. Yeah, yeah, like Real World. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I, was the original I, one. I mean, I, we didn't have, like, MTV or Sky until, like, fucking, I don't know. 96? No, 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 it was 2000, 2001. Oh, you lucky bastard. Yeah. Um, but, so basically, I mean, if you're talk, talking in earnest on terrestrial television, yeah, probably, yeah. I don't know, maybe 2000. Pop Idol, whatever the fuck it was, yeah. No, bef- Big Brother was lit before Pop Big Idol. Brother. Yeah, Big Brother was what? 99? Oh, 99, 2000. 2000 around, yeah, so yeah. around that, around turn of the millennium, let's yeah, just yeah. say, yeah. So we knew a world before that, right? There are kids growing up now who are like 17, who has literally been, Simon, Simon Cowell has been on screen for them their entire lives. Yeah. Yeah. Just like, for, I'm going to chuck in a football reference, just like Arsenal supporters, their manager has been there for 20 years now. So if you're like an 18... Arsene Wenger. Arsene Wenger. He's been, hey. there, he's been there for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're 18, you literally don't know a manager other than Arsene Wenger. Yeah. Yeah. These kids don't know a life without Simon Cowell. That's how it was for me and, and Alex Ferguson, by the way. Alex Ferguson. There yeah. you go. Yeah. But, okay, so reality TV has become so prevalent that... 
there are people, there are friends that I've got on Twitter. Yeah. They still watch, and they're like our age or older. Yeah. They still watch Celebrity Big Brother. Yeah. They still watch fucking whatever that island shit is where they have to eat. Love Island. And, and, no, there's Love Island. And then there's that. Oh, I don't know. Get me, get me out of the jungle. I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. That's it. Or some shit. That shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They still watch Big Brother. Yeah. yeah. They still watch whatever the fuck that Geordie Shaw, all that shit. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. They, they watch all of these shows. Right. And tweet about it at the same time. I'm like, you're our age, man. Uh, you, you haven't even got the excuse that you're like 17 and no, no different. You've been brainwashed your entire life. You're like, jiggity check yourself. Before you. Break yourself. And it's like, I don't know. I'm like, come on. We all have our addictions. We'll have our preferences. You could say, well, Jessel, why the fuck are you watching Liverpool? You know, just being shit every year. Yeah. That's a great point. <laughs> and I, I'm trying to sort of watch them less and less and divorce yeah. myself a bit, you know. But I, I don't know. I just think reality TV, this is this was my point. Reality TV is really base level programming. The amount of effort and artistic prowess that goes into it, yeah. Is, is so minimal, it's just a money-making venture and a sort of brainwashing thing, right? In order to get adverts. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you're talking about real art, like say, for example, I went and watched Blade Runner 2049 last week at the cinema. Yeah. That is real fucking art. Fuck, I've not seen it yet. You don't have to watch it. Right. Yeah. But you just have to know that the amount that has gone into it, like the, the, the visual guy now, I think his name is Roger Deakins, we did a podcast on that guy, I mean, the visuals on it are just so unbelievable. And when you're watching it on this gigantic screen, you're like, shit, this was worth my two and a half hours because it's mm. a fucking long film. This and was worth or whatever This film. was worth my 10 quid or whatever yeah. I paid, yeah. Do you need to watch the first one to see that film? Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. So now I've got to watch two motherfucking movies. And that's another point. That's the point we made on the podcast. We were like, okay, these kids nowadays... Blade Runner was a cult classic anyway. It wasn't like a huge thing like Terminator or this or that. Right, yeah. right, it wasn't right. like a proper cultural touchstone for everyone. Mm-hmm. Are you now going to commit five and a half hours of your life just to be like au fait with Blade Runner? Do you mm-hmm. care or would you rather just like sit and watch Netflix for two and a, mm-hmm. five and a half hours or whatever? Yeah. Does it more feel that category of like Total Recall? It was like one of the B or C kind of grade movies, but it, the people that fuck with it really fuck with it. Blade Runner was hugely influential. Like, it, it was a cult classic. It didn't do well initially at the box office, but then it was very often imitated and replicated right. in, in many, many ways. Um, and the, the new one is, is very different in feel, massively different in feel. Um, but it's, it's an amazing watch. Saying that, six people walked out of the cinema after about an hour and a half. Oh, shit. So it's not for everyone. It's not for Ooh. everyone at all. But my point is, is that the amount of effort that went into Blade Runner 2049 versus the amount of effort that goes into Love Island or whatever the fuck it's called yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, is disproportionate. Therefore, what are you going to invest your time in? Are you going to invest your time in shitty thing that's designed to just hook you in with crap? Made in Chelsea. Oh my God, my wife was made in Chelsea. I just want to fucking throw the TV out the window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Or are you going to watch something that is really beautiful and someone has put real effort into it? And even if you don't like it, you can appreciate what they've done. Mm. Yeah. So it's about, these are about choices. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. These are about choices. You know? I think that's a, a good final lesson. Definitely. Shit is, a, shit is about being conscious right now and being aware of what the fuck's going on and then mapping your choices towards it because there's a whole bunch of temptation there's a whole bunch of brainwashing. There's potentially a recession that where we come out the other side and things will be very, very different. And right now you've got a good opportunity because there is a lot of information in the world today on the internet where you can reposture yourself based on that information and make some choices. And uh, that would be the a nice summary for our podcast with no name. Life is a challenge, man. Yeah. You've got to fight, you know. And now more than ever... There are so many things trying to suck you down, suck you in, and you've got to swim really hard upstream just to get out of the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, be conscious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I, I, think that, I think that being conscious, which also is a, a very, it, it's a parallel term for mindfulness. Use your fucking brain, basically, right? Yeah. Like, if you find yourself in a situation where you can predict that 
in five days time you're going to regret it or in 15 minutes time you're going to regret it call upon your fucking brain at that point and be like yo i need you right now do you know what we've such been a, here before but it's such an interesting choice of words this is the last point right I, I've always le- I learned from my, my spiritual journey when I was about 20 because I had this breakdown and then really, really built myself back up. That, that there is no such thing as the mind. Yeah, the mind is an illusion, a complete illusion. Yeah, so when people say you're disillusioned, you should take it as a compliment. It's disillusion. You're getting rid of the illusion yeah, and you're seeing what there really is. Mm-hmm. And, and the matter of fact is your brain, your brain is your brain. Yeah, that, all this shit is going on in our brains. There is no mind. Yeah, the mind is just a concept. It's not real. Mm. Yeah. So your choice of the word brain is very interesting because that's what it is. It's our brain. We need to rewire our brains. Fuck this whole mind shit. Rewire your brain. Mm. I bet that's what Russell Brand says in his book as well, right? Or, or at least kind of alludes to it. I don't know. He, I'm going to read that book. By the way. Yeah, I mean, I've got the audio book. I, he does. I mean, he, he, he ultimately says, like, to take control of your thought. Like, he basically makes you reinterpret your your thoughts. So for example, when you reach for your phone, you normally reach for your phone to quench the thirst of understanding what that notification is, to break the anonymity of what that signal was. When the signal comes to you, dude, dude, it's anonymous. You don't know the context behind it. It's the same notification you get if you're going to get a video of a cat and a skateboard. It's the same notification you're going to get if your grandma's just died. It's just, dude, dude. So you reach for it to figure out well which one is which one is it it's the same way it's the same bro it's the same reason why we scroll on facebook and instagram is this relevant to me is this will this give me some sense of purpose will this color in a part of the picture of my life that's not quite colored in because of something i did do didn't do what 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 so will this next notification be the thing that 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 gives me the thing that i'm looking for will this next thumb flick reveal the image text quote video that gives me the information i want like when you scroll down and you see trump make an announcement trump isn't effect like let's keep it real he's been in power for some time trump isn't affecting your average motherfucking day especially if you're a fucking brown guy in this country (laughs) he's not affecting your day in any which way shape or form so why look at him say some outlandish shit to the president of singapore or whatever like no one cares and that's what i'm realizing is that and the time, I, the time I spend on that, reinvested elsewhere, could yield so much more. And I think when you're on your deathbed, this is the big punchline, when you're on your deathbed, you're going to be like, what the fuck have I achieved with my life? And you then look at, you know, and you, they say your whole life flashes before you in front of your eyes, but your life is only made up by X amount of events. And of all those events, most of them can be bucketed into certain buckets certain bins and unfortunately for us from 28 26 27 onwards me and you 80s babies from 26 onwards a huge part of how we categorize our life some of it's going to be chasing girls some of it's going to be getting high a lot of it's going to be fucking being on social media and that you're going to fucking regret that and everybody 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 fuck who they are wants to die with as little regret as possible no one dies without regret but you hope that the last thought that's going through your head as you pass over to what the fuck happens on the other side, it's not like, fuck, I fucked this up, fuck, fuck I'm gone. You want to be like, ah, oh, man, I'm cool. I honestly believe, bro, that if I died before my infatuation or addiction to social media, I'd have been happier. Because people you say to me, like, people you say to me, like, only two, three years ago, Raj, fucking, you're doing this, Vaynerworld, da, 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 Wu-Tang Clan, blah, 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 Russell Peters. What's the plan? And I'm like, I'm living, like, what's the five-year goal? I'm like, I'm living my five-year goal right now. Everything you see, me, me able to go from here to here, that's there, shake hands with everybody and everybody cool with me, that was always the plan. I feel like right now, if I died, 2017, 37 years old, I, it's the only time in my life, dude, that I die with regrets. Wow. Because the last three years, I've just fucking hemorrhaged a bunch of time. Upside, met a girl, enjoyed that very, very much. But like, even then, I could have just shifted the time resource from social media to that girl mm. and getting to know each other better, settling down, having kids, whatever the fuck it is. But, like, I do feel like recently time has been wasted. And the only way I can counter that is by using more time and not wasting it. 
so that I'm net efficient. Yeah. You get me? Yeah. Like I'm more net efficient over six years than I was over the last three years. Yeah. The way that I frame it, this will be my last point. Yeah. The way that I frame it with um, social media is that if you die and if there is a place called hell, it's a place where you're forced to read your own tweets for the rest of time. <laughs> and I was like, shit, and the devil got me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, wow, would I really be like now playing Jesse Ware, this song, blah, 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 now playing, you know, or like, oh, Liverpool, what the fuck? Or, oh my God, yeah, that video is so good. Or, or oh, Donald Trump is a twat, blah, blah, blah. Would I really be happy in hell? having these tweets like having to read these own tweets well let me tell you some real shit right i feel like my dad is probably worse than me right i feel like our parents generation are more addicted to social media because of the fact that it's more novel for them for us it's just another app on our phone albeit a more engaging one for our parents they're still tripping balls off the fact that this little box in their pocket is showing them a picture of their grandkids right so for them it's even more of an infatuation plus i don't know if you've ever looked in your dad's whatsapp but it's full of fucking bullshit jokes and the fucking bollocks. Like all of his boys that he wasn't able to talk shit with because real life kicked in. They had to open a shop and they couldn't fucking hang out and be fucking twats like us, like how we are right now. That's all happening right now with your 62 year old dad on, on uh, WhatsApps. They're literally t- telling fucking dick jokes right now on <laughs> yeah. WhatsApp. It's real they fucking talk. Are. They right? are. They really are. Yeah. So if you imagine all that shit and then I look at my dad, right? And I thought, I thought to my, I saw, I saw my dad obviously this weekend over Diwali weekend and I was like, if I were to show this motherfucker like my point of how much time is he spending on the phone, the best, most gangster shit I could do would be to take my phone, stabilize it on a shoebox or some shit and aim it at him and record a 40 minute video of him doing what the fuck I do. I'm no fucking angel. But record a 40 minute video of him on the phone. Just head down, scroll, scroll, WhatsApp some Fuwa back, WhatsApp some Mama back, WhatsApp some fucking uncle that he grew up with in fucking Mombasa back. And just be like, yo, dad, I need to show you this shit. This is 40 minutes of your life. And you're 62, bro. You're not going to be around. Like, it's not as if you're going to get a chance to do all this shit all over again. This is 40 minutes where me, mom, the babies, my uncle, kaka kaki. Everyone was in the fucking house. Yeah. And this is just 40 straight. This is a video of 40 minutes of you on the phone. I need you to watch this video. I need you to know that nothing happens in it. You just sit on the couch on your phone. But you need to know what that 40 minutes feels like. Because if you're forced to watch yourself on the phone for 40 minutes, you'll taste every drop, every second of what 40 minutes is actually like. 40 minutes when you're in social media goes back and goes by in two seconds. So you lose respect for the equity of the 40 minutes. If you have to watch that 40 minutes objectively, you're like 40 minutes is literally 40 times 60 seconds. Yeah. It's like a lot of motherfucker. I don't know what the calculation is, but that's 4,800 seconds or whatever the fuck it is. Like it's a lot of time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm hoping that, that, you know, motherfuckers would just realize that shit. I think this is a really interesting conversation. And I think if me and you over a period of time, whether it be once a year or whatever, spearhead this conversation, talk to each other about it. Even if fucking two or five or 12 or one person goes, you know what? Fuck me. Like the same with the Russell Brand book affected me. Yeah. If one person goes, fuck me, man, I need to better myself in that part of my life. And that leads to another kid not being fucked up. Who's 12 years old. Whose dad that is that her does right now. I think that's a real fucking good thing, man. Yeah, man. I mean, to be honest, it like the podcast that I do, you know, someone might look at it and say, oh, it's just a vanity thing or this or that. Cause everyone's springing up with fucking podcasts right now. Mm. The reason I'm really doing it is that, you know, there's a slight chance with my history that I might die quite young. You just never know. I'm touch wood. I'm doing fine right now. Yeah. But you just never know. Mm. And and I'm just trying to create this little treasure trove for my children. Actually. Legacy. Yeah. Or, or no, but, I mean, in, in practical terms, it's it's something that they could tune into and hear my voice and hear me drop a, the occasional gem or, or like things that I think they might like in the future when they're of a certain age and stuff mm. like that. Yeah. And it just so happens that I'm putting it public, right? And and like thousands of people happen to have downloaded it. I don't have no streaming stats for it because you don't get the fucking streaming stats. Could be loads more. I have no idea. Mm. But that's that's the main reason I'm actually doing it. That's the first time I've actually told anyone that. <laughs> but that's the real reason, to mm. be honest. 
So that's why from now on, especially, kind of, I, I, I kind of like, I want to get, I want to get better, I want to get better. But also, I want to get better for my children. You know, mm-hmm. that's the reason. If you ever listen to any of my shows, the first words are "Hello, everybody." It's my son saying it into the microphone. That's the reason that he's doing it. Whoa! So, so that sample, that little vocal sample, that's my son at the beginning of, the, of every single show. Whoa! Yeah. And it reminds me, look, I need to be on this. I want to do this. This is for my children Mm -hmm. and of wider service to the world in case anyone fucking likes it. (laughs) You know, but if they don't, fuck it. It's for my children. Yeah, yeah. And it's. I've got to say the relationship podcast, we talked about at the beginning of this podcast. I don't know how much, I don't even know if if we'll include the original beginning of this podcast in the podcast, but like, that was such a dope podcast. So check out, go to iTunes, type in Transatlantic Rebels, uh, or go to your podcast player of choice and type in Transatlantic Rebels. That is Jessel, aka at Jessel TV. Yes. On Twitter. And uh, that's my boy. I fucking love him. Just a fucking cool guy. And uh, and I'm Raj Katecha, and we are signing out on the probably first and last episode of Lazy Luana. <laughs> <laughs> I might just hijack it. Transatlantic hijack. Transatlantic Luana. <laughs> no, you, you want to post this on yours? Yeah, I might do. Then if you do that, then let me know because then I'll then I'll just promote that you are. Yeah. We're yeah. getting technical. We're out of here. Peace. Peace. Did it end already? When it's all covered.